This happened maybe 20 years ago, when three friends and I went camping at Kentucky Lake. Well, technically it was Lake Barkley. So we had just settled on a campsite after hiking maybe an hour from where we had parked. It was on a small inlet, maybe 300 yards long and 150 yards to the opposite shore. We had it all to ourselves and we camped near the U-bend of the inlet so we had a limited view of the lake proper. We could see it to the left, but it was mostly blocked by trees on the opposite side of the little bay. It being relatively hot and humid, we were all standing in the water after having set up our tents and things like that. The sun had gone down maybe an hour earlier, so there was still a little bit of light left. I think it was early summer or late spring. So we're standing there, shooting the breeze, you know, up to our shoulders in the water. It felt great. Suddenly, above us, there was a meteor-like fireball that lasted maybe two seconds at most. It appeared to be very close, but there's no way to be certain. We saw it fall behind the opposite spit of land, and presumably land in the lake. Immediately afterwards, the entire lake lit up, seemingly from the bottom. Seriously, all the water visible from where we were standing, including our little inlet and the portion of the lake proper, lit up like the entire floor of the lake was made of spotlights. It flashed two or three times and went out. There was no accompanying sound whatsoever. A few seconds went by when one of the guys asks, okay, did anyone else see that? which was followed by an evening of us all theorizing what it could have been because yes, we had all seen it. To this day, none of us have any idea what it was, but we all saw it. It may not be as weird or terrifying as some stories, but it's easily the strangest thing I've ever encountered. I think it was maybe three years ago when this happened. I remember that it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family and I's cabin while the others went Christmas shopping for food, last minute packages for some friends and something else. I don't really remember exactly why they went out, but that's not so important. My point is that I was all alone in our cabin I was playing some games on my phone and listening to some music on the radio in my room on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that I suddenly got cold and went to get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow in my peripheral vision. I didn't really care that much because I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing tricks on me because I didn't really like being alone in general, especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About an hour passed and I had nearly forgotten all about the strange shadow, but then I saw it again. And this time it stayed in my peripheral vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I got a little creeped out about it since I was the only one in the cabin at the moment, so I decided to lock the door to my room. Right after I locked the door, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first I thought it was my little sister, who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot. I asked out loud, what's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer, Yes, I fell while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed toward the stairs when it finally hit me. I was alone in the cabin, so whatever was upstairs was not my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt and my dad's slippers, and it was freezing cold outside. I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin 
and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still. And even though I couldn't make out any eyes, I got the feeling that it was staring at me. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for maybe about 30 minutes, and I cried until my family finally arrived. My mom and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I remember is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to enter ours. Ever since that day, I refuse to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling that I got that day in the cabin can only be described as unwanted, like someone or something wanted to harm me. I still have nightmares about that shadow figure thing, even today. It's haunting my dreams. This story happened a long time ago, but I still remember it like it was yesterday, and so does my cousin. Our families were very close growing up. We were there often, usually just watching movies. We were young, and this was around the time that the killer clown thing was happening. So when we would watch movies, they would usually be horror. The Conjuring, Annabelle, etc. I was about 12 at the time. My cousin was 14, her brother was 12, and my brother was eight. We were in their basement one night while our parents and older siblings went out for the night. Babysitters weren't something we had. It was lock the doors, stay together, and don't answer the phone. My cousin's basement had a TV in the corner of the room, and on the same wall was a projector. My cousin, 12-year-old boy, and my brother had the hockey game playing on TV and Call of Duty on the projector, while my cousin and I, she was a 14-year-old girl, were sitting shoulder to shoulder on the couch, back to the wall with our headphones in, watching videos on our phones. Our brothers decided they were hungry and turned on the lights as they went upstairs to find something to eat. My cousin and I sat for about five minutes before her brother's bedroom door in the basement slowly closed. When the door came to a full close, the lights in the room turned off, along with the projector and the TV. I paused the video that I was watching on YouTube and first assumed that it was a power outage as I didn't believe in ghosts. But when I checked my battery, I saw that my iPod was still charging. Before I could do anything, I heard the sound of my brother and cousin laughing, almost giggling behind my head, as if they were right behind my ear. But it sounded off. It didn't sound exactly like them. It creeped me out, and my head shot up and toward my cousin, who was already looking at me with her eyes wide. Like I said, we were backed up to a wall, so there's no way anybody could have been behind us. Neither of us missed a second to get up and run upstairs. The first thing we did when we got up there was to look at each other. I said, you heard it too? She agreed, explaining to me what she had heard, which was exactly what I had also heard. We walked toward the kitchen and saw her brother. We explained to him what had happened. He didn't believe us and told us that my brother had been on the third floor bathroom ever since they left and they didn't talk or laugh. This creeped out my cousin and I even more, and when he went downstairs, everything was turned back on and the bedroom door was open. We talk about that night every few years, and it still creeps us out to this day. I'm not sure if I'm haunted or something, but I do have a lot of ghost stories that started happening after that night. Kids that I babysit keep telling me that they see things around me, or similar things from that night will happen to me in my basement, with or without other people there. 
Whenever I tell people about these events, they seem to have something happen to them afterwards, and stories come back to me. Usually the ones who joked about what happened or didn't believe in it had an encounter. I think something followed me out of her basement that day, but I don't know if it's evil, if that's possible. I still can't really explain it. It's just odd. For our anniversary, my wife and I rented a cabin around Divide, Colorado. Our last night there, it started to snow. We were laying in bed, just relaxing, and we started to clearly hear footsteps on the front porch of the cabin. Nobody should have been around. I went to check, and nobody was there. Being a believer in Bigfoot, I thought, well, maybe it's something like that. So I looked out the windows and there was no sign of anything anywhere. There was fresh snow on the ground and there were no prints. That's what I really thought was weird. I laid back down and it happened again. So I got up, looked around, and there weren't any prints or anything. It happened a third time after that. I couldn't figure out why there were no prints when we clearly heard footsteps on the front porch. Then, we heard this wrestling noise coming from the roof. That happened a couple of times too, but I chose not to go outside to look. My brother and I were staying the night at our grandma's house. For context, her house is in the middle of the ghetto. My brother and I were watching TV and my grandma was at the store. Suddenly my brother says, wanna go in the basement? Not trying to sound like I was weak, I said yes. Now this was the worst decision of the month. So we go into the basement and it is really creepy. When we reach the bottom of the staircase, the door shuts behind us. I just shake it off as natural, but still a little uneasy. We go into the garage because her garage is in the basement. So we start going through there and we find a rusty pipe and a motorcycle handlebar and some faint writing on the wall. Obviously there were other things like lawnmowers and stuff like that. All of a sudden we hear bam like a metal door slamming. It was the laundry room door. So my brother and I are crabbing our pants, so we run back upstairs, scared out of our minds. Later that night, we start to fall asleep. Grandma's asleep. And then we hear what sounds like all of the basement doors opening and slamming. My grandma's not awake and we end up falling asleep. We tell grandma about it the next day and she just laughs and says, oh, that's just Jim messing with you. Then she explains that Jim was the old house owner who died there. That didn't really help us, but I guess it eased our minds a little bit. This all happened when I was a kid. I was spending the weekend at my mom's house. My parents were separated, and I woke up one morning and watched some cartoons in her room while she slept. Eventually, I turned the TV off and went downstairs to make a bowl of cereal. I sat down at the table, which was about 10 feet from the open basement door. As I was eating, I heard my mom call me very loudly from the basement. The only things down there were a washing and drying machine and a toilet. I walked over to the door and peeked down there, and it was pitch black. That's when I remembered that my mom was asleep upstairs and hadn't come past me at all. 
So I freaked out, ran upstairs to her room, and sure enough, she was there asleep. There was no way that it could have been her, and it was just us in the house. The apartment gave me off, strange, and creepy vibes. My mom and I and a few other people all hated the feeling that you would get in the basement and the back room upstairs would give off very negative energy. Every time you went in there, you would start feeling kind of sad and very alert. She never used that room. It only had a couple of boxes in it for the five or so years that she lived there. Has anyone else had similar experiences? So something just happened in the basement and I thought I'd tell you about it. Here's a little house layout to help a bit. Our living room has two ways to enter, one from the kitchen and one from the front door. The staircase leads right down to the front door. The way to the living room from the front door has you pass a hallway that has closets and the door to the basement. So it's 1.39 in the morning and I'm done scrolling through social media and decide to sleep. However, I want to cuddle with my kitty while I rest. I have a kitty sleeping on the headboard, but she's so peaceful I don't want to interrupt her. So I decide to head down to the main floor to find one of my other two cats. Down the stairs, I see my fluffy Newfoundland dog sleeping by the front door, as usual. I decide to take the way through the kitchen to grab a snack. Then I come into the living room and I see my other cat sleeping in their cat tree. They look so peaceful, I decide it would be rude if I let one sleep and took the other one to cuddle with. So I let them sleep and started my way back into my room through the hallway. As I come to the archway from the living room to that hallway, the basement door slams all the way open hitting a table that we have behind it. I'm scared out of my mind and immediately turn around to go the way through the kitchen. As I approach the front door, I pet my dog and I remember thinking, maybe I'll see a ghost down the hallway. I can take a peek. My biggest fear is ghosts and demons, so I have no idea why I did this. I don't even walk to the hallway. I just peek around the wall. The basement door is swaying back and forth gently. I get even more scared and run to the top of the stairs, into my room, shut the door, pull up Reddit, and basically now dreading the fact that I have to pee because I don't want to leave my room. I want to say that it's the air conditioning, but down that hall, there are no vents. The only vent is in the laundry room, which is past a weirdly long hallway, and it has a door. I have no idea what could have made that door do that. So I live in a basement in my parents-in-law's house. My wife never goes down to my room in the basement. I'm almost always in there alone. Since I've lived in there, a few things have been happening that I dismissed as ventilation or something else, such as my door slowly creeping open. Frankly, I wouldn't even have noticed it opening if it weren't for the green indicator light of something that I have plugged into the wall outside of my room. At night, if I have to leave my room, I exit and make an immediate left, and I dip into the bathroom for restroom use. I can almost always sense an entity in the living area or bar area of the basement. This feeling is compounded when I exit the bathroom and my reflection appears on the wall out sliding doors. Sometimes I don't have a face in my reflection. I quickly re-enter my bedroom and shut and lock the door. Some nights there's a knocking from within the mattress that wakes me up, usually between 3 and 3.15 in the morning. 
I have no way of dealing with this other than risking it and fleeing upstairs to my son's room. My son is three, has autism, and frequently says, that's scary, over and over in the basement, looking toward the bathroom and living areas. The light switches that I have access to when leaving the room frequently cease to function right when I need them or will flicker out almost violently as I'm on the staircase halfway up and out of the basement. I can hear rustling in the middle of the night sometimes as well, and I usually convince myself that it's a mouse. Lately, this has graduated to the sound of footsteps in the ceiling in the middle of the night. Most recently, when I heard those footsteps, no one was home but me, and I searched the house, wielding a knife for an intruder, to find no one. I think this entity is aware that I know it exists. I once interacted with it via the mirror and it contorted my face. I have no idea what this is or if I should be concerned. My husband told me this story the other day. This security guard, now a middle-aged man, had no idea that the two of us were active on Reddit, but he wanted us to tell his story. So here it is. I was a young man back then and had been working on the job for a few years now. I was a security guard working the security detail in a large shopping mall. Back then, Shopping malls were a new phenomenon in the country, and people had no idea how to guard them properly. There weren't exactly a lot of us on the security detail. I was joined by a very young man, inexperienced. It was probably the first time he'd been on a job like this, and this older gentleman who had been working security all across the area. I had only been on the job for about a fortnight. We were all just sitting around on our posts. I had expected another slow night at the mall. Things didn't really happen in our part of the city. It must have been around midnight when I started hearing the clanking of chains from the basement area. The sound was so loud that it startled me. I sat up in my seat and became attentive. Maybe I was mistaken. But as the clanking continued, I realized it was definitely coming from the basement area. Confused, I paced around for a bit until the younger guard came running toward me. He asked me about the sound. I told him I had no idea what it was. After a bit of discussion, we decided to go check it out. We grabbed a torch, informed the older gentleman, and started descending into the basement below. The mall had shops in the basement, but the sound was coming from the storage area and that was extremely unusual. No one had access to the basement except for a handful of employees, including the three of us. There was only a single elevator that could take you to that floor and a set of stairs. The young guard and I opted for the stairs, mainly because we wanted to surprise or potentially scare whoever was making those sounds. By the time we descended to the ground floor, our torch turned off. This alarmed the two of us. We were already creeped out. The young man had already started to sweat. I told him not to worry, reminded him that we had guns if something went south, and opened a small single door that opened into the basement. As you can expect, it was pitch black. All we could hear was the clanking, now louder and right in front of us. I was afraid for my life, we could have been attacked at any moment. My heart started to race. I banged the flashlight on my leg and it sprung to life. There was an empty chair right in front of us, a few meters from the door. The clinking continued. Shaking, I pointed the flashlight around and saw the most bizarre scene unfolding. Metal chains, where they'd come from, I had no idea. We had no chains in storage, were being moved from one end of the basement to the other. 
I could see them gleam in the torch's light. I was stunned. No one was carrying them. The young guard I had brought with me was already screaming. I pointed the flashlight around until it landed on the chair. Only now, there was a middle-aged man sitting on it. Looking at us, he had a terrifying expression on his face. He was clearly angry. A weird gust of wind blew by me and the torch fell to the floor. The young man screamed again and became unconscious. All the while, the chains continued moving. I was so frightened that I ran, leaving the young man on the floor of the basement with God knows what. Something I still feel bad about to this day. So, I decided to post this after the sixth person who has come into my basement has said that they feel off, overwhelmed, and like they're being watched. I usually bring them down to play billiards, and I have my old PS2 and Xbox 360 down there as well. The basement is finished, painted, and carpeted, and there's an office down there too. They always leave saying that they all felt the same things, and that they're so put off by it that they never want to go into my basement again. Yesterday, one of my friends left his mask in my basement, went back down to get it by himself, and said that he felt like his heart was beating out of his chest. I also want to note that when we first moved in, for the first month or so, we would find an unreasonable amount of dead centipedes across the basement floor, but only in the room with the billiards table. The office room never had a single centipede in it. All of a sudden, the centipedes just stopped. Never saw one again. It's been two years. I felt the same weirdness, but I always ignored it. I'm usually afraid of basements because I generally don't like being underground, so it wasn't unusual to me. But then everyone else started talking about it. I've also noticed that my house has become more active as in lights turning on and off when nobody's home, doors opening and closing for no reason, doorknobs jiggling aggressively, things moving to very peculiar places. I really don't know what to do with this. Back in 2014 to 2015, I was in high school and living with my parents. My parents were heavy on Christianity growing up, so I was raised going to church two times a week. My mom is extremely spiritual as well. Anyway, for years, my mom kept telling everybody that there was a lot of spiritual warfare that was going on in our house. Everybody in my family just thought she was crazy but I strongly believe that it was true. My sister started going down the wrong path. My dad was apparently cheating on my mom for years, things like that. My parents started noticing some weird type of feces in our basement window wells. So one night my mom asked me to help her find out what it was by going into the basement with the lights off and only using a flashlight. We went down there and were quietly waiting to see if we could figure out what it was, when all of a sudden we heard a whisper that was so loud, it almost felt like it was coming from a surround sound speaker. It was almost as if somebody came right up into both of our ears and whispered. It immediately sent chills down my whole body, and my mom too. We both froze for a second, and my mom said, what was that? Was that you? And I said, no, what was that? We both bolted up the stairs screaming and we refused to go back down that night. My dad tried to say that we were just crazy and hearing things. I've never felt so uncomfortable and violated in my entire life. Something definitely whispered into our ears, but we couldn't make out what it had said. 
Still to this day, thinking about it freaks me out. Since then, my parents divorced and sold the house. Growing up, I had experienced a few strange things in that house, and my sisters did as well. Sometimes we would hear what almost sounded like a phone vibrating in the basement, but we couldn't ever figure out where it was coming from. It happened multiple times in the span of five years. I truly believe that there was a demonic entity messing with my family. This happened to me many years ago. I was maybe 10. I'm 23 now. My sister and I were over at her friend's house, which she had told us was haunted during prior visits. It was just us. Her mom was at work and her little sister was at daycare. We were down in the basement, which was half finished. It was furnished, but the walls had no siding yet. We were messing around down there, jumping on the couch, just doing kid stuff. We decided we were hungry, so we headed upstairs, shut the basement lights off, and took an immediate right at the top of the stairs into the kitchen. We were in there maybe a few minutes making sandwiches, when all of a sudden we heard the loudest, most blood-curdling scream I've ever heard come from the basement. It was absolutely terrifying. I don't know if three kids have ever gotten out of a house so fast. We sat on the curb across the street until her mom got home. I've had several encounters with what I presume to be the paranormal, but that was by far the most horrifying and memorable. It still gives me the creeps to talk about it, and to this day I'll sometimes text my sister to ask if she remembers it, just to make sure I'm not crazy. Let me set the scene. I used to own a house near the mountains on the northern side of Colorado. This was a period of time where I had just gotten fired from a job because of pandemic related reasons and was home alone. I lived with my roommate at the time, but he went out to some club that night, leaving me home alone with my dog. I hate to even think of this, and this is the first time I've ever told anybody besides my neighbors. It was around 8 p.m. on a Friday, and I was watching Friends on TV. While watching, I heard what sounded like boxes shuffling around in the basement. My dog immediately noticed this and brought his head up. Our basement wasn't finished, and we had a window down there which wasn't in good shape, so I had just brushed it off thinking that the wind was making noises. After a while, the noises never stopped, I decided to grab my light and head down there with my dog. I grabbed my light from the kitchen and opened the door to the basement. I started walking down the stairs, calling my dog. The only odd thing was that my dog wouldn't come down with me and was making that little high-pitched noise the dogs make when they aren't happy or whatever. He refused to go down into the basement and just stood at the top of the stairs. To give you perspective on how my basement was laid out, all of my extra stuff from my childhood, like clothes and things like that, were piled in the back right corner. So when you walked down the stairs, on the very right was where all that stuff was. And all my roommate's stuff was right next to mine on the left. There was a bench with all of the previous owner's stuff that they had left there too. While going down there, the sound was still very clear and it was getting louder the farther I got in. I saw the window opened and making noises and decided to go and close it, thinking it was nothing else. As soon as I closed it, it felt like a hand grabbed my leg, but it wasn't a normal hand. It was super hot. My legs were swooped back and I fell down. All I can remember from this point on was my dog barking extremely loudly. 
I then woke up and found myself in the closet of my roommate's bedroom. I walked downstairs and looked at the time, and it was three o'clock. My roommate wasn't back yet. I literally looked at the clock and grabbed my phone and dog and ran outside the front door. I went over to the neighbors, which was a mile away. I ran there with bare feet. I didn't have a car at the time. When I got to the neighbors, whom I barely knew, I ringed the doorbell extremely fast. About a minute later, a man opened the door and asked why I was ringing his doorbell this late at night. I could tell he was quite frustrated with me. I told him everything, and he said that the previous owners moved out because the husband of the house ended up hanging himself in the basement. We talked for a bit while I let my dog run around in the back. I called my roommate to not go home and to come over to the neighbors. Around an hour later, he showed up and we all just sat there talking about what had happened. Around 10 o'clock in the morning, I headed back to my house with my roommate to find the sofa flipped, all the doors open, and the cabinets in the kitchen all open with dishes broken on the floor. I decided to go live with my sister and sell the house around two months later. To this day, I'm not sure what that was, and I haven't had any other experiences. I had just broken up with my girlfriend at the time. I heard the ghosts, especially when they die like that, thrive off of bad energy or whatever, so maybe that's why everything happened. I don't know. But if you have a way to explain it, let me know. I like stories about the paranormal, but I've never personally experienced anything, and I tend to be pretty skeptical about them. However, there was a weird experience that I wanted to share and see what people thought about. Back in 2009, I was in college a couple of hours away from home. My grandparents, who I lived with through the last two years of high school, were away from home at their second property, where they were building their retirement home for the weekend and I wanted to get off campus. So my friends, let's call them Jess and Nina, and I decided to go to the house for the weekend. My friend Jess claims to be sensitive. She has told me stories about things coming into her room when she was growing up, and I can tell she's genuine. But to my knowledge, science has yet to demonstrate the existence of any kind of life after death, so I remain skeptical. I could tell something was off as soon as we pulled up to the house. I'm grabbing my bag from the truck, and I look over to her to see her staring up at the house. I ask her if she's okay, and she just says one word, ocupado, and then proceeds to grab her bag from the truck and we all head inside. Let me give you the layout. The house was built in the 80s and my grandparents bought the place in 99. The previous owner had died in the home, in his sleep, I think. It was a two-story brick home that backed up to a lake. It was quite a nice place to live, but there were also parts of the house that always used to creep me out for some reason. The front sitting room and dining room upstairs, and the stairs to the basement where I lived in high school. But like I said, I never experienced anything. Anyway, my grandparents knew that we were coming down for the weekend, but they were going to be gone for a while, so they shut off all the water in the house except for to the downstairs bathroom. We all go inside, and a few hours later, Jess decides to go downstairs to use the bathroom. Nina and I stay upstairs watching a movie. She's gone for quite some time, and when she comes back upstairs, she asks us what we wanted while she was in the bathroom. Nina and I just look at each other, confused. We hadn't left the room and we hadn't called for her. We didn't know what she was talking about. She asks if either one of us had come downstairs and tried to turn the bathroom door handle while she was in there. We looked at her, incredulous, and tell her that we had not. She grows pale and my heart starts to race. 
I think someone is in my house. Nina and I grab knives from the kitchen and go room to room searching for an intruder. We find nothing. The house is quiet for the rest of the weekend. I still think about that sometimes. I don't know what it was. Maybe my friend was daydreaming and maybe she got into her own head. Maybe she was messing with us, although she swears up and down that she wasn't and she looked genuinely terrified. Maybe there was someone in the house, though I'm pretty sure we would have heard them opening a door. Also, there was a security system that beeped if any door or window were opened. I just don't know. What do you think? My uncle has a large stretch of wooded property in Missouri, about an hour and a half drive from St. Louis. He has a cabin, a small man-made lake, and trails throughout the woods. When we visited, we would spend a lot of time driving ATVs down the trails. One of the trails leads to an abandoned mining area. The area has a toppled over mine shaft, a couple of cement buildings, a sheet metal storage shed for core samples, and a sheet metal building with showers and a couple of rooms. There's a metal fence separating two sections of it that, for a while, was still mostly intact. All of it is in disrepair and hasn't been used for mining for many decades, perhaps a century. All of this lies in a large open area that has no trees, just sand and mud flats, which made it the perfect place to drive four-wheelers. We'd visit a few times each year, and we would take the four-wheelers out to the flats and have a great time riding. We never felt unsafe, and sometimes we would even go out at night to stargaze. Eventually, we started to notice that these sights pop up at the edge of the woods around the flats, like sticks stuck in the ground in lines or circular patterns with small burn piles. There were usually shotgun shells, bullet casings, and beer cans spread around. Sometimes we would see spray-painted symbols on pieces of trash or trees. Basically, it looked like people shooting targets and drinking out on the flats with a touch of weirdness with the symbols. So we didn't think much of it and just decided that we wouldn't go out at night and we started carrying guns with us when we went out, just in case. What finally did it for me and kept me from going out there was when we discovered that the fence had been nearly completely destroyed. Only the posts were left, and on every post someone had stuck a can or a jar of something on top. And all throughout the flats and on the trails that ran its perimeter, we would find cans and containers stuck onto the ends of tree branches. Again, it wasn't anything too weird. Like, we know people go out and break stuff and do other dumb things. What got us was the scope of it. The fence was probably a half mile in length, and every single section of metal mesh had been removed, which would have required considerable time and energy, even with bolt cutters. And that alone wouldn't be too weird, because people loot metal for scrap all the time. The thing is, none of it was gone. It was just laid on the ground next to the fence. And then somebody had taken the time to cap the posts with cans and other containers. Then to boot, they had taken the time to place items on the ends of tree branches every 50 feet or so, all along maybe two miles of the trails and on the perimeter of the sand flats. That was the last time I went out there. It's been 10 years and I've moved states and I have limited contact with that part of my family, so I don't really know if anything else has happened. I know it's probably nothing paranormal, just some weird human activity out in the backwoods of Missouri, but it was still pretty creepy. Every night, I walk down the stairs to the basement and then into my gaming room to unwind with some video games. 
As I reach the bottom of the stairs, I turn on the light, but I keep it dimmed, just so I can make my way to my room. At about midnight, it's time to go to sleep, so I open the door of my gaming room to find the lights completely turned off. I deliberately keep the switch at halfway, and when I go to the staircase, they're always pulled all the way down. I've always thought that it was my wife who would come downstairs and shut them off. I politely asked her why she would shut the lights off, and she replied, I've never gone downstairs to shut the lights off, not even once. For context, I've seen shadowy images run by in the basement. I dismissed it as being fatigue. However, when my niece was just three years old, she said that there was a boy with red eyes on the staircase. We thought it was just her childhood imagination. Then when my son was two to three years old, he ran into my arms after staring at the staircase. I asked him what was wrong, and finally he said, there's spooky with red eyes. Could entities actually physically manipulate the light switch? I can't explain what's going on. Back when I was still going to high school, I spent the night at my best friend's place. He lived in a basement. I woke up and went to the bathroom. And as soon as I got back to the room and laid back down, I closed my eyes. Then I felt like someone or something was staring at me. I opened my eyes and saw a pale child staring me in the face. His dark eyes felt like they were staring into my soul. I yelled out for my friend, and as soon as he came into the room, the child disappeared. I told him what happened, and of course he didn't believe me. But now he says that apparently everybody who's ever slept in that room has seen him. His girlfriend, his brothers, and me. But he has never seen the boy. To this day, I can still remember what he looks like. I was never sure whether I should believe in the paranormal or not. Sure, I'd heard strange noises home alone at night, or felt the energy in the house shift to something more sinister in a matter of seconds. But what I experienced in August of 2021 convinced me. It's taken a long time to process what I had experienced. I've mostly tried to pretend that it didn't happen. And to be honest, I really wish it hadn't. For context, last August, I had moved into the guest bedroom in our basement. I'm 15 and having the entire basement to myself for most of the day and all night was awesome. I immediately began to regret my decision though, as I discovered how unsettling the energy in my basement is. It's really hard to explain, but it just feels off, especially at night. I was literally always on edge whenever I was down there. Sleeping was quite difficult as I was never really calm. I often felt an overwhelming presence watching over me and I was really hating my decision. But I knew my mom would be upset if I changed my mind so soon, so I endured the hell I was living in. I quickly need to describe the layout of my basement so you can understand where everything is taking place. Once you enter my basement, there's a large living area. Attached to that is a hallway that leads to where I've been sleeping. So I woke up at around one to two in the morning to the sounds of about four voices in the living area of the basement. I could never actually make out what they were talking about, maybe because I had just woken up but I'm pretty sure they were speaking in another language or maybe very broken English. 
As I was listening to the voices, I heard quiet footsteps approaching my door. The only way that I was sure they were footsteps was because the floor in our basement, especially in the hallway, is very creaky. I pulled the covers over my head and shut my eyes. I fell asleep almost immediately and nothing else happened that night. I've also felt people touch me in the basement, but usually those experiences are comforting. I usually believe that to be my father who passed away in 2015, as I've only felt those when I'm sad or angry, still paranormal, but unrelated to the experience I just told you about. Either way, that experience in the basement terrified me, and I'm still not sure how to explain it. In September, my partner and I signed the lease on a dream apartment. I was ridiculously excited, and I kept telling everybody I knew all about it, to the point where I was probably pretty annoying. One day, a friend of mine came to visit me at work, and of course, I told her the news of our new place. She asked me where it was, and when I told her the location, she turned pale and seemed uncomfortable at best, and flat out scared at worst. She asked to see a picture of the inside, and when I showed her, she let out a long sigh of relief, then proceeded to tell me one of the creepiest stories I have ever heard. It turns out that about five years ago, she had lived in the house directly next to mine with her sister and boyfriend. Starting almost immediately when they moved in, they began hearing noises out in the kitchen area at night when they were sleeping. And occasionally, they woke up to the cabinets or kitchen tools being opened or scattered around. Eventually, they started to hear what sounded like kids talking in low voices in the kitchen at night, occasional crying, and crashes that sounded far off, but still somewhere in the house. Around this time, my friend and her sister started to fight a lot, and she said that they'd both been feeling extremely irritable about everything. Their house was broken into while they were all at work one night, but nothing was stolen except for some cheap costume jewelry. There was cash, valuable jewelry, and designer clothing in the house, but all of it was left untouched. Later in the same month, they received a visit from the cops who said a neighbor had called about screaming and crying coming from the house and had reported that they had left their children alone when they went out. They didn't have kids. The cops were called a few other times and finally got a search warrant. Somehow, they ended up finding a trap door under the kitchen window area that was covered in a layer of leaves and dirt they found out that it was the remains of a very old root cellar. I live in one of the oldest cities in America, and much of the structures are built on top of older structures. That's not the surprising part. One thing led to another in the search down there, and the police recovered some very old skeletal remains of two children. Nobody seemed to know if the skeletons or the root cellar were there first. During all of this, my friend and her sister broke their lease and moved out of there immediately, as they were terrified to be there any longer. I went through with my lease and I live in the building next door to where all this happened. My apartment is an old adobe market that was converted into an apartment in the 70s, and it's been an absolute dream to live here. No scary vibes or noises at all. The couple who live in that house now seem pretty nice and keep to themselves. We all have high adobe privacy walls and coyote fences, and I feel tempted to see if they know about all of this. But I'm afraid it might make them uncomfortable if I approach them about it. In any case, that was the wildest story I've ever heard.
I want to start this off by saying that I live in my mom's basement. Many people have said that they think it's haunted. Weird things have happened, like the washer turning on by itself, and sometimes even clothes appearing folded when they hadn't been folded previously. That's in the back room, though there's a larger main part that I live in. My bed and TV are set up where our pool table used to be placed when I was younger. In the middle of the night, when everyone else in the house was asleep, I used to hear people playing pool, so that area is no stranger to spirits. When I first moved down there around two months ago, I woke up to a dark figure standing a few feet away from me. It didn't seem threatening, it was just a little weird. I've also had other paranormal experiences. I don't know if they're related to the entities in the basement or what, but I guess I'll share them here too. For instance, yesterday, my YouTube showed numerous profile pictures that weren't mine, but only on my Apple TV and only on the top corner icon when I would click on the profile. It would show my normal one, which is just the standard issued one. But then on the Apple TV, all these other ones appeared. I just stared at it for a minute, confused, then got up to look at the picture and it had something to do with God. I couldn't really read it because of how small the icon was, but it seemed to be some type of Bible verse. Then before my eyes, the profile picture changed again to what looked like a picture of Jesus. So seeing this, I ran to my computer, figuring somebody was on my account and I should probably change my password. But that's when I discovered that the icon on my account there was totally normal. No one knew had logged into my account and there were only three devices on that account, my computer, my Apple TV, and my Xbox. So I once again looked back at the TV and the icon was now different. This time I could actually read it. It said, the power of Christ compels you. This slightly shook me to my core and I ran back to my computer to change my password. Eventually the profile icon went back to normal on its own a few hours later, which was also somehow slightly alarming. Like I said, I don't know if this has anything to do with what's going on in the basement, but my TV's in the basement, so maybe. I hope this made sense. I don't know if anything like this has happened to anyone else, but please let me know if it has. So I'm on staff duty and finishing up. It's 5.05 a.m. The gym opens at five o'clock sharp. I'm supposed to bring the master key over and unlock the gym and sit down here while people PT, since we had a few incidents of misconduct. So I get the key and my things and come down to the basement where the gym is. There are no windows and the lights are on a sensor with a switch. When flipped on, they come on and stay on until the motion sensors go to sleep. Then you have to walk into the center of the room and wave to get them back on. When flipped off, they're off and that's that. So I open the door and hit the switch and nothing. It clicks, but no lights come on. So having just watched scary videos all night at staff duty, I prop the door open with some plates by the entrance and get out my phone and turn on the flashlight. I flip the switch in the other direction since they aren't labeled and in the army up and down might as well be the same thing. It clicks and no light. Now I'm noticing that I can hear the other light on the far side of the room click all on its own. Well, that's not creepy and it may realistically be assured in the shitty wiring. I flip the switch up again and hear the far switch click a half a second later. So light in hand, I decide to find my balls and walk out there and wave at the sensor. I start walking and I'm pretty sure I should be tripping the sensor, but the only light is from the emergency sign. And now across the room by a weight machine 
is a reflection off the metal, like someone's down there with me. I walk back and flip the switch down. This time, I don't hear the other switch click and the lights come on. Bad feelings banished. Victory. Only, I decide to walk back out, carefully watching the sensor. By the time it picks me up, I'm significantly closer to that one weight machine than I was the first time. Which means I wasn't in sensor range. Which means someone, or something else, set off the grid for me. Or maybe it's all just a bug in the wiring. My dad works for a contracting company in St. Louis, Missouri. The building's interior is exactly the same as it was in the 1960s, all except for the dust and deterioration. The actual date of construction is 1910. It's only a five-story tall building. It's nothing immensely big. It was previously used as a law firm, but when the firm left, they decided not to take anything with them. There were tons of law books, paintings, desks, etc. But the basement. Back in 1960, they started to renovate it, but never finished. So the basement is an extremely dilapidated 1910s, paint falling off, broken glass ridden, rusting freight elevator, deadly tetanus infested nail cesspit. But my dad and I went in there anyway. Keep this in mind. My dad coaches boxing as a hobby, and he's huge, all muscle. He's fought all his life, and even he is scared of that basement. Every time we go down there, something is different. The first time I remember going down there, the plaster on the walls of a hallway had fallen, and I mean all of it. The whole hallway was stripped down to its bare structure. I assumed, of course, it was because of the renovation, but my dad said, what's all this shit? It wasn't here before. So we go down the hallway, and yeah, in and of itself, it's nothing really special. But there was a metal chair in the middle of this dark hallway, and for whatever reason, it just freaked me out. My dad turned on the lights, and they worked for a second, but then they all busted. Some of them just fizzled out, probably because of how old they were. So down the hall, there was a boiler room, it contained this rubberized trench coat, rubberized to avoid stains, and a bowling ball bag. Inside the bowling ball bag was a cleaver with what I assume was a deer bone handle. After that, we left. A few weeks later, we came back down and all the plaster on the floor was gone. We went to the end of the hallway and the boiler room door was closed. Maybe we closed it, but I don't remember doing that at all. It doesn't seem like our priority would have been to close that door when we were getting out of there. By the way, nobody has the key to the building except my dad. He and I are the only ones to enter the building, ever. At the end, there was a T-shaped intersection. On the wall, there were three identical pictures of the same exact priest with a deadpan expression. His eyes were glazed over like he was possessed or couldn't see or something. We came back after a few months, near Christmas. We only made it down the steps and immediately left. There was a Christmas tree, little lights blinking, and a Santa Claus doll with the most indescribably creepy grin I've ever seen in my life. Something was definitely going on in that basement. About two years ago, my husband and I took our five kids to a water theme park in Idaho. We live in Washington state. We borrowed my dad's trailer and truck and thought it would be less expensive and more fun if we camped at a campground down the road rather than the one made for the park. I've driven through Idaho before and so has my husband, but we've never stayed there before. 
To preface my experience, I have had nightmares on occasion where I felt like something was trying to possess me. I always end up reciting the Lord's Prayer or yelling or something. I'll be honest, sometimes it takes a couple of tries and I always have my husband wake me up because I'm screaming. I regularly pray for protection, wear protective crystals, and ask my guardians for protection also. I feel as though because I regularly research and read into the paranormal, it's best to take precautions. So here we are at this campground. The first night, everything was great. Nothing happened. The next day, we take the kids to the park, spend all day there, and come back to cook dinner and get ready for bed. I also must say, while I have read a lot about sleep paralysis, I have never experienced it until this night, and I have not since. Once we were all in bed, I started to fall asleep. While asleep, I feel awake. I can see the trailer around me and kind of what felt like a blur, but I'm unable to shout or scream or move. I look to the end of my bed and see what looks like a short, four foot tall or so demon-like thing. It has horns and it's difficult to make out its face and it's terrifying. All of a sudden, I feel my husband grab my arm and I'm awake. He says, you were screaming, are you okay? I told him I was fine and tried to go back to sleep, but the same thing happened again, except this time the demon was closer to me. I remember shouting in my head, Jesus is my savior, go away, but he wouldn't. I remember trying to scream for my husband, but I couldn't. Then once again, my husband grabs my arm and wakes me up, saying I'm still screaming. At this point, I still told him I was fine. I attempted to sleep once more, and the same thing happened again and again, and every time, the demon thing was even closer. No matter what I tried, he wouldn't leave, and again, my husband would wake me up. Eventually, I told him what was going on. He said he was sorry. This time, I didn't try to fall back asleep. I wrapped as much of him as I could around me and desperately tried not to sleep. I felt like something was trying to pull me towards sleep, but I fought it. Next thing I know, I woke up the next morning and told my husband the entire story. I have never researched the area. I can't remember the name of the campground. Because I was so terrified, I haven't really shared this story until recently. When I was in northern Nova Scotia this last year while camping and fishing, I saw these odd shadow figures in the treetops. Everything was proportional about them, except for their arms. They were just way too long. They appeared just after dusk and they never came near to the ground. They didn't necessarily feel malicious. It just felt bad like I shouldn't do anything that could draw their attention, or else it would have gone badly. Nothing of note happened other than them being there, but I'd never heard of anything like it before. Is anyone aware of any legends or anything describing shadow figures and treetops? I'd love to even have a name for these things, because to this day, I still have no idea what I saw. When I, when I was around five, I went camping with my parents in a place called Bear Creek Reservoir in BC. It's a very isolated place, deep in the woods. We got there by driving up an old logging road. The actual reservoir itself was very beautiful and quiet. I actually looked up the area on Google Maps and it still gives me chills, even looking at it from a satellite perspective. But anyway, the day passed by without incident and we mostly just swam the whole day. We went to bed that night and nothing unusual had happened. But the following morning, I woke up in my parents' tent just as the sun was making its appearance. I unzipped the tent and noticed a figure standing maybe 50 feet away, 
the light was still fairly dim, so it was hard to make out distinct details. But it was just standing there, staring at me, unmoving. The entity had the figure of a woman of average size, but instead of seeing a face, there was just darkness. Even so, I could tell that it was looking at me. And instead of clothes and skin, it had leaves and sticks, as if it was made from them. I remember feeling very afraid of this creature, like if I left the tent, I wouldn't be seen again kind of fear. So I tried waking up my parents, and they were both really pissed that I woke them up, and they didn't believe me at all, until they finally got up later and explored the area. We ended up finding a bunch of man-made structures made of branches and other weird stuff in the area, but not one where I had seen it, so I don't know. Anyway, that's my true story. Let me know what you think. I'd like to go there again someday and see if I can find anything, but maybe it's best I don't. I was out walking the woods at an ungodly hour of the morning. I believe it was around 1 to 2 in the morning. Last year, I was working at a church youth camp in Wisconsin. The camp was on two sides of a highway, and a tunnel under the highway connected the two sides of the camp, so that the campers could more readily access the other side. My then girlfriend and our friend liked to walk the woods at night after we were done with work. The first time we had done this, we were scared shitless by a fox barking. The deer in the woods were fairly docile and didn't spook easily. We soon learned to identify the sound of the fox, and we saw it several times. One night, it was just me and my ex-girlfriend walking through the woods. As we rounded a corner in the trail, I noticed movement in the field by the tunnel. Gray shapes. I assumed they were deer, and I pointed them out to my girlfriend. We continued our walk past the tunnel. Just as we passed the entrance to the tunnel, maybe about 20 yards, we heard the most horrendous screeching. It sounded as if somebody was being strangled. It did not sound at all like the fox, but we shrugged it off. We continued up the road. All of a sudden, I had this weird feeling, and I turned around to see a tall figure standing in the road. It was dressed in white and it was all hazy. I wondered if I was a little too tired and was seeing things, so I poked my girlfriend and asked her to take a look behind us. She immediately noticed it too. Something we both noted was that our eyes kept sliding off the figure. It was like we couldn't keep our vision centered on it. I was thinking this and she voiced it without me saying anything to her. I pulled my hunting knife from its sheath, but I somehow knew that it wouldn't do anything. Without looking away from the thing, I said, let's go, now. We backed away and then started running, and we didn't stop until we were back to the cabins. When I got back inside the cabin, the guy in the bunk next to me was still up texting his girlfriend. I quickly told him what I had seen. He looked at me and said, that's why I don't go out at night. I never went back out into those woods at night again. And when I talk about this, I still get chills and a nervous feeling. We had no drugs or alcohol. We were both under 21, and we were working at a church camp with strict policies. So I have no idea what we saw. This happened back one summer when I was about 12 or 13, before cell phones were common. My mother rented a cabin that we could stay at about four hours north of our home. My father couldn't attend due to the fact that he was working, but that was fine with him. We drove up to the cabin, which was literally just a 15 by 15 foot room with an attached bathroom, just enough for a bed, a table, and a small TV and it was cute enough from the outside. There were several cookie cutter cabins you could rent, I think seven in total, that all arced around in a C shape with parking spots in front 
and at the front of the line of the cabins was where the owner of the cabin stayed in the front desk area, if you will. Anyway, when we first arrived, we were the only people there. No other cabins had been rented out, even though it was August, and this area, although semi-remote, is a tourist destination. It's in northern Michigan. The gentleman that worked at the front desk and owned the cabins came out to greet us. I didn't pay too much attention due to the fact that I was 12 and excited for the fun outdoors adventures that my mother and I were going to have. Climbing the dunes, eating ice cream, swimming, having campfires, all the good stuff. Well, I remember him giving my mom the key and saying, the bathroom window is broken and doesn't close all the way, nor does it lock. Which, if we were the only people living there, why not give us a room in which the bathroom did lock? We thought it was kind of strange, but shrugged it off. After a day of adventure, we went out, came back at dusk, and went to bed. The next morning, Saturday, we woke up and went to get into the truck, but it wouldn't start. Strange, I will admit, at the time it was a newer SUV. I don't recall what was wrong with it, but I remember the owner of the cabins coming out and being like, Oh, your truck is broke? That's too bad, let me call someone. My mom insisted that she could call somebody, went into his office, used his phone, and called somebody to come and fix it. As we were waiting for someone to get there, the owner came out and said, did you guys have any problems with the power last night? My mom and I kind of shook our heads, confused. Oh, uh, well, sometimes in that cabin, the power will randomly go out, but all you have to do is come out here and flip the breaker. He then proceeded to show my mother where the breaker was, which happened to be outside of the cabin, behind it, on a pole. After getting the truck fixed and having another day of adventure, we came back ready to settle in for the night. As we were sitting in bed watching TV, the power went out. It didn't flicker, just boom, out. My mom grabbed a flashlight she had packed, and we went out there and turned the breaker back on. At this point, we were feeling incredibly uneasy, like anybody would be. We got back in bed, and about 10 minutes later, the power went out again. My mom jumped up and ran outside, only to see a man which I assume was the owner because nobody else was there, running away from the fuse box. We hightailed it out of there so fast. Luckily, everything had been packed because we were leaving the next day. But still, that guy was creepy. So a couple of my friends and I were staying at my family's cabin for a week in the summer. A lot of weird stuff happened throughout the entire week. The last day we were there was the day of the creepiest and most unexplainable part. One of the first days after my parents left, one of my friends went out for a little run late at night. After about five minutes, he comes sprinting back to the cabin and tells us that he saw a black figure in the woods beside him. We all thought that it was weird, but we didn't really think much of it. The day after, nothing really happened except for when we were in the jacuzzi. This was around one to three in the morning. We started talking about the scariest dreams we had ever had, and so we all told each other. But then one of my friends begins telling the rest of us that when he was younger, he used to not only dream, but also see in real life this tall black figure in his room at night, and that it was a really serious thing, because he started getting really emotional about it and started crying as he was telling us. As he's telling us the story, I hear footsteps in the woods below us, but I decided not to tell the rest of them until the next day. Regardless, we were all pretty spooked at this point. The last day, we didn't really have anything planned, so we just hung out at the cabin. When it started getting late, around one to two in the morning, one of my friends told us that his towel kept falling off the hook that he had hung it on. 
This happened probably around three times. When he hung it up the last time, I saw him do it. He hung it properly, and there was no way that it could have just fallen off by itself. But we went to check on it later, just in case, and it had fallen off. His blanket, which had been folded on the bed the last time we checked, was now spread out on the floor. Cabinets in the bathroom also kept opening by themselves. At around 4 a.m., we all decided that we should probably get some sleep, and so we did. And because we were all scared, two of my friends stayed in my room for the night. Just as I was going to sleep, my friend who was on the floor asked if I could hear the rustling noises coming from the kitchen and living room. I said no, so the three of us slowly walked out through the hallway into the living room. And just as I enter and turn on my phone's flashlight, I felt my stomach drop more than I ever have before. The couch and chair cushions had been flipped upright, like they were standing vertically, and the pelts in the chairs had been thrown onto the floor. Since we were so freaked out, we got everybody out of the cabin, and for some dumb reason, we called the cops. Of course, they couldn't do anything, they were probably just thinking that we were a bunch of kids on some strong drugs, but we weren't. It was about 5 a.m. at this point, and we didn't get any sleep that night. I know it doesn't exactly sound scary, but I had never had anything paranormal happen to me before, and it was probably the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. This story is 100% true and takes place in Cincinnati, Ohio, specifically Claremont County. I'm female, 31 years old now, and this happened in 2006. So at the time I was 17 going on 18. My boyfriend will call Mark, my friend will call Amy, and her boyfriend, now husband, will call Neil, are the ones involved in this unexplained event. So for some background first, there is this abandoned cabin in the middle of the woods. You can only get to it by walking about a mile one way. There are abandoned cars, an ambulance, some tractors, and some other random vehicles, like a short school bus, and they're all covered in gunshots. There's not even a path to drive a vehicle back there. If there were, we'd be walking a mile one way to get to them, so... I'm not even sure how they got there or how long they've been there. My boyfriend and I had gone with two other friends previously to this encounter, and it was creepy, but it was nothing compared to what happened when we went with Amy and Neil. So on our previous trip, we went with our friends that we'll call T and J. T and myself went upstairs and we had a Ouija board. We just asked random stupid questions that I can't even remember. What I do remember is that it spelled out hooey, and we thought that was funny. We said goodbye on the board, and we were looking around the upstairs, which was really just an attic. We found massive kids' socks in the walls, like tons of them. It was really random and weird. We got startled when an alarm clock started ticking. It wouldn't stop, so I smashed it to pieces, and that was that. We walked downstairs where the boys were and made our way back outside. We found a creepy well that was all covered up. And then, all of a sudden, we heard that alarm clock start ticking again. But I know that I broke it, so it kind of spooked us out, but nothing major. We saw an outdoor cellar that we had gone into, and there was a child's boot seemingly a girl's, with a bone inside the shoe. So we were like, okay, we're done for today. So my boyfriend and I were telling Amy and Neil about this cabin and what had happened when T and J came with us. So we decided that we were gonna go later that day. The day that this encounter happened, Mark, Neil, Amy, and myself all went to the lake 
packed a cooler with food and stuff like that, and probably spent about five hours or so at the lake, just eating and hanging out. We left the lake and stopped at Amy and Neil's homes, dropped the cooler off, which was in the trunk of the car, and then went on our way. After getting everything out of the trunk from our lake trip, we headed to my boyfriend's parents' house, where we parked the car and began our hour-long walk. We had flashlights, and that was it. The walk there was very uneventful. We had to walk through two huge drainage tunnels to get to this cabin. We make it there, and it wasn't dark out, but it seemed different this time. I'm not really sure how to explain it, but it was just different. We did come later in the day than previously, so I chalked it up to it being that. Just like last time, when we get inside, I decide to go upstairs and I ask Amy to come with me. I wanted to show her the socks in the wall, and I also wanted to check on that clock that I had broken on the last visit that I heard ticking outside previously. As we start to go up the stairs, there was this big crash, like something had been thrown or knocked over. Amy gets freaked out, and then out of nowhere, she books it outside and back down to the creek, yelling at Mark, Neil, and I to come on. I go chasing after her, and she's in tears, having a full-blown panic attack. She keeps talking, but I can't understand her. Finally, I get that she saw someone looking in the window at us. We tell the guys, and literally nobody is around. It's just the four of us. Since she's so distraught, we decide to just go ahead and leave. As we're walking back down the creek bed, heading back the same way we'd come, Mark and Neil are just kind of kicking over these huge rocks. We stop and realize that there are huge rocks, I would say boulders, standing right up in a line on the entryway down to the creek bed. They couldn't have been there, not even 20 minutes prior, because we would have noticed them when we were on our way there. So this seriously freaked us all out. This is not normal, and it's not natural. So we pick up the pace and start to haul ass out of there. We make it to the first drainage tunnel, and we turn on our flashlights. Literally, none of them will turn on. Four flashlights that worked perfectly fine on the way there. And now none of them will turn on. We were like, what is happening? So 30 minutes later, we're back at my boyfriend's parents' house where Amy and Neil had parked the car. Amy gets in the car because at this point she's just ready to go home and forget that this event ever happened. The rest of us are still outside the car. Suddenly, Amy gets out of the car, screaming and jumping up and down and flailing around. She's covered in ants. We were like, what the hell is going on? So we look, and they're coming from the back seat, from the trunk. Neil opens the trunk of his car, and laying in there is this huge, rusty, extremely old wool sock covered in ants. Now remember what I said earlier? We had been in and out of that trunk all day long, and there was nothing in that trunk when we left their house from dropping off the cooler. Now there's a wool sock covered in ants that covered the car? This was too much for any of us to wrap our heads around. Needless to say, we've never been back there. And personally, I will never go back. It turns out that the man who used to live in that cabin was named Hubert, and he was often called Hui. My boyfriend had actually been to the cabin once before I ever went, and he found these journals there. The man, well, let's just say he did some pretty terrible things to kids. His journals went into detail about it. Obviously, I'm not going into detail here. But looking back at that first Ouija board experience, Hui makes a lot more sense. This was honestly the first and only time that I had ever encountered something to this level. Like I said, I'll never go back. Even to this day when I talk about it, I get goosebumps. I can't explain what happened that day, 
And I have no idea what Amy saw that scared her so badly in that window. But I do know that boulders do not stand straight up on their own in a line, and nobody could have done that fast enough. Nobody could have messed with the four flashlights either, because we had them in our hands the whole time, and no physical person could have put that dirty old ant infested wool sock in Amy and Neil's car trunk. It was locked. So I guess the lesson I learned is if you're ever wandering through the woods and you come across a random cabin, just leave it alone. You never know who lived there, what they did, and who or what may still be there. Unfortunately, I think we learned that the very hard and unsettling way. We were on our trip to Yellowstone from California. We were a group of seven adults. We took a flight to fly to Salt Lake City, Utah, and then we drove up to Henry Lake, Idaho, where we had booked a cabin. We reached the cabin at about 5 p.m. on the first day. This was a huge cabin with a living room, kitchen, one master bedroom, and a dining room downstairs with a set of stairs on either side to go upstairs. Also, there was an entrance into the kitchen as well as the landing outside the master bedroom from outside, apart from the main entrance that ended up in the living room. There were about four bedrooms and three bathrooms upstairs, a very old and rustic looking cabin. We didn't feel anything bad during that entire evening. However, the nighttime did feel very eerie. My husband and I slept in one of the bedrooms. One of the couples used the master bedroom downstairs and another took the master bedroom upstairs that was farther down the hallway from our room. The only single guy in the group took the bedroom next to us. So on our first night there, we all went to our respective rooms at about 11 p.m. since we had plans to leave early for Yellowstone the next day. My husband and I both fell asleep as soon as we hit the bed. I don't know what time it was, but I suddenly woke up with a scream. At the same time, my husband woke up with a scream too. While I do have nightmares and have in the past where I would cry in my sleep, it was the first time that I had ever screamed and I don't remember having any dreams or nightmares that night. My husband has never had nightmares, so it was unusual for him to wake up that night too. The guy in the next room was on the phone talking to somebody. He heard our screams and came in to check on us. We assured him we were okay. Again, we all went to bed, but I kept having weird feelings throughout the night, and I was completely unable to sleep until I saw the sunlight coming through the window. We all woke up at around 9 a.m., and we were discussing the incident. The other two couples were unaware of it, but they did mention hearing random footsteps throughout the night thinking that we were up walking around. We were there for five days and we didn't experience any other events for the rest of the stay, but the cabin gave out significant negative energy and not a single one of us wants to stay there again. We would leave as early in the morning as we could and come back late at night just to sleep. We haven't had any other experiences like that ever again. This is something that happened a while ago at a cabin that my family and I were renting. My sister and I were sitting outside on the back porch around 11 p.m., maybe getting closer to midnight. We were talking when we heard a noise. To me, it sounded like someone was clapping their hands, kind of like in The Conjuring, at least that's what it reminded me of. No one was outside, and the neighbors were pretty far down the road. So if it was someone, they would have had to walk all the way to the house and be standing pretty much right outside of it. The rest of my family were talking inside the kitchen. 
We could have heard them, and it would have been obvious if they were the ones clapping. It happened three times in three different locations, once right next to the house, once in front of us, which would have been in the back, in the woods, and the third time came from the front of the house. I really don't know how to explain it, but it was pretty creepy. Back in April of 2011, my family and I stayed in Skyline Cabin C82 at Jellystone Park. It's the one right beside the nature trail. Each of us experienced something that we believed to be paranormal, but none of us admitted it to each other until after we had gotten home. It turns out that my sister, who was eight, and I, who was 11, actually saw the same figure at the same time. We don't remember the time of night, but both of us recall waking up for an unknown reason to find a tall man standing by the bed with his arms crossed and an angry look on his face. At first, we thought the figure was my dad and we were confused as to why he seemed angry with us. Then we realized we could see straight through the guy to my coat hanging on the wall. I quickly rolled over to the other side of the bed in fear as my sister slowly did the same. Later that night, my sister woke up again to see a man sitting at the dining table in the other room. She turned on her flashlight to see who it was and the figure disappeared. My mom also woke up during the night to see a white orb fly in through the window and out through the door. As soon as the light went through the window, she heard a voice scream, you don't belong here or you aren't welcome here, one of the two. Our stay at cabin C-82 is something that we reminisce about often. We've been curious if anyone else has experienced anything strange there. So if you've stayed at Jellystone Park in Laurie, Virginia and experienced anything paranormal, we would love to hear your story. When I was younger, I used to spend hours in the woods behind my house. One time, when I was about nine or 10 years old, I was in the woods and I saw some stepping stones that led into a clearing. Those stones had never been there before. I peeked into the clearing and saw this little cabin with smoke coming from the chimney. It was surrounded by a well manicured lawn. Although it looked peaceful, charming even, something in my head said, run. So I did. About a week later, I went back into the woods to the same spot and the clearing was normal again. No stones, no cabin, just a basic clearing, the same one that I had grown up with. I haven't stepped into those woods again ever since and it's been about 20 years. I don't know what that cabin was, how it appeared or why it disappeared. And I don't know what would have happened if I had followed the steps and gone up to it. But to this day, I'm just very glad that I didn't. This happened around the time that I was 11 years old. My dad had just bought a log cabin in the woods of Maine. The place was completely dead. And while we had neighbors, we rarely saw them. We had already spent a few nights up there on a previous trip, about a 250 mile trip just to get there. We decided to take another trip up there for a long weekend. As this cabin was old, my parents decided to get some work done on it to make it more appealing. So they hired people to come and redo some things in the rooms. At the time, 
there was only one bedroom available for us to sleep in. As night fell, we all got ready to sleep. There were six of us in that one room. Mom, Dad, me, two brothers, and sister. In the middle of the night, I wake up to audibly clear boot steps in the living room. The bedroom was connected to the living room. All that was between us was an old wooden door and a rusty deadbolt lock that would definitely come off if somebody were to kick the door in. As I was still waking up, I was in that foggy state that you are kind of when you're just becoming conscious. I wasn't all there. But then I heard the voice of my sister saying, do you hear that? So now I know that this isn't just part of a dream leaking into reality. I sit up quickly and look to the other bed and both of my parents and my sister are looking at the door and looking at each other. My heart starts to race, not knowing what to think. I then hear my sister say, are we going to die? Which really doesn't help the situation at hand. As my other brother starts waking up, the boot steps stop for a moment and then continue. Mind you, there was no fading of the steps, which means that the sound came from a general area. We continue to just look at each other in fear and worry, none of us knowing how or why somebody would get into our cabin. As my last brother begins to wake up, the boot steps stop. My dad then gets out of bed and grabs the machete that he placed under the bed and heads toward the door. Placing his ear to the door slowly to try to see if he can hear anything else, he can't. Then, in one quick motion, he unlocks and opens the door while wielding his weapon, prepared for anybody that might be there. He walks out into the living room, then to the other rooms to see if anything was there but everything was clear. As a matter of fact, all the doors and windows were locked. There was no possible entry into the cabin, seeing as nothing had been tampered with. It was really hard to get back to sleep that night. As I woke up that morning, I remembered what had happened the previous night. I remembered hearing those boot steps, and I even confirmed with my family that it wasn't a dream and that we all experienced the same thing. As there was no possible way that a person could have entered the house, I came to the conclusion that this was paranormal. I had my share of paranormal experiences growing up. My family and I have tried to debunk this a hundred ways, but we just can't come up with a solid solution. If you think you have a reasonable cause for this incident, let me know. And before somebody says it was somebody outside or an animal, no. I know for a fact that the boot steps came from inside the house. This was definitely one of the scariest experiences of my life. Our family has a small cabin up north that we go to when the summers get too hot. Our cabin has four rooms and a loft. There's a kitchen area, a living area, two bedrooms, one bathroom, and the loft. The rooms are tiny and our family is big, so we're always bunking up and sleeping on air mattresses all over the place. This particular weekend was 4th of July and the whole family came up to the cabin. Once everybody got settled in and had lunch, we all wanted to go for a walk in the woods. It was a beautiful day and we all started to venture out. My nephew, who was four at the time, started to get a bit fussy and tired. So I took him back to the cabin with me for a short nap. I set up the air mattress up in the loft and I put him down for a nap. It was almost 1 p.m. and I figured he could nap for 30 or 40 minutes and then be ready to go back out and play afterwards. My nephew then wanted me to lay down next to him, so I did, and we both started to fall asleep. 
I finally woke up by the motion of the air mattress moving. I figured my nephew had maybe rolled over to the other side or something. But now I was awake, and I could feel the sun on my face from the small window above. I glanced over to my nephew, and he was fast asleep, not facing me. I started to nod off again, but then I was woken up by the same motion of the air mattress moving. It's that sound, you know? The swooshing of the air. It felt like somebody had just sat down on the air mattress at my feet. So I look up and I see nothing. My nephew is still sleeping in the same spot. So then I just lay there, awake, and my eyes were still focused on the lower part of the air mattress, down by my feet, when all of a sudden, an area of the mattress started to depress, you know, like when someone had just sat down on it and made the indentation. I heard that same swooshing sound of a rush of air, and I screamed. My nephew woke up and I grabbed him, and we ran down the stairs and out the door. We waited outside until the rest of my family returned from their walk in the woods, and when I told the story, my sister-in-law told me that her mother had experienced paranormal stuff at the cabin for years. Thanks for letting us know. To this day, I still don't know and can't really explain what it was, but nothing like that has ever happened to me since. I don't know about the rest of the family though. I was up north at my uncle's cabin when I saw something really strange. I'm laying in bed at night and it was like one o'clock in the morning, so it was pretty dark outside. We're surrounded by trees everywhere. I'm laying on the bed upstairs and I'm staring outside at the windows which are downstairs because I can see it from where I'm at. The windows are very large. From the far left window, I see this massive bright white orb floating above the deck or porch. It moves back and forth between the one window and the other. I can't fully remember if I saw it pass over or behind one of the blind spots between the windows, but it just kept going back and forth multiple times with some speed. I gaze at the window and watch the orb travel from one side of the window to the other side multiple times. The size of the orb, from what I can remember, would be about the size of a large watermelon. I know that it was not the moon. Even when the porch is wet, the light of the moon doesn't really reflect. It was just my dad, my grandpa, and I there. There's also one other important thing. This place is where my uncle David's ashes are buried. Not my uncle the owner, but my mom's other brother. He's not buried near the porch of the house, though. But I still wonder if it might have been him. This is a story of my first encounter with the paranormal that I can remember. I was about eight or nine years old, and I was playing with my little cousins at their parents' house during a family gathering. Behind their house is a large forest located in Northeast Florida. My cousins, their neighbor and I, were playing hide and seek in the forest. The only rule their parents had was to stay within sight of the house. Of course, we didn't listen. I was getting bored of the game and I wanted to do some exploring. I convinced the other kids to join me as we headed deeper into the forest. I noticed this ball of light floating in midair. I thought I was seeing things. I remember rubbing my eyes just to make sure that it wasn't in my head. I asked my cousins if they saw it too, and when I pointed it out, they confirmed that it was there. It was bright and bobbed back and forth, changing from a yellowish color to a transparent green hue. 
We followed it for, I can't remember how long, but we reached a small cabin and the orb disappeared. It was dusk at this point and curiosity got the better of me. My cousins and the neighbor kid were too scared to go up to it, but I did and I peeked inside the window. I saw a dim light inside and what I thought was a human skull sitting on a table next to some jars. Then a shadow from within moved across the far wall. I got chills and signaled to the other kids to run back the way we had come and I took off immediately behind them. We ran as fast as we could and we didn't stop until we were inside the house and I locked the door behind us. I remember getting in trouble because our parents couldn't see us from the kitchen window. I didn't tell my mom or anyone else what we saw because I didn't want to scare my cousins or worry our parents. To be frank, I'm not even sure what I saw or if what I think I saw was there. Later that night, I woke up to the sounds of helicopters and dogs barking outside. It was well past midnight and I asked my mom, who was standing in the kitchen with the rest of the adults, what was going on. The adults had stayed over after the party and they were all just standing there, their eyes glued to whatever was happening in the backyard. I stood there and tried to peek through the kitchen window with them. My mom says that they found the body of a woman in the forest and a cabin where her killer was staying. There was a manhunt going on. I remember not being able to sleep for the rest of the night. The glaring white lights that shine through the folds of the blinds from the helicopter was only one of the reasons. I'm still not sure what that orb was. Maybe it was the spirit of the woman who was trying to lead someone to her killer or maybe it was something more nefarious. I'm not even sure if one of the other kids told anyone about the cabin that we had seen. Maybe they did, and maybe one of their parents called the police. I just remember us not being allowed to even go near the tree line anymore whenever we visited after that night. I never wanted to anyway. I'm 24 now and have had many other experiences since then, but this is the one that I actually forgot about and was reminded of recently when reading up on Will-O-Wisps. I just thought I would share where it all began for me. I was up near Antelope Lake, California exploring this old mining town known as Lucky S with my girlfriend and her parents. There were a total of four of us. Lucky S is out in the middle of nowhere on this seemingly endless fire road. Then it just appears from the forest and you suddenly find yourself between at least four cabins, all in different stages of collapsing. When we got there, it was in the middle of the day, no later than 2 p.m with clear skies. Knowing I was going into buildings that may or may not be haunted, I wanted to try to capture anything and everything that I could. So I brought my Nikon to take photos. We explored four or five cabins, ate some food, and then walked about a quarter mile farther up the road to the second half of this rundown town. While my girlfriend's dad was examining some old piece of large machinery and explaining how it used to work, I walked off alone to check out the next cabin. There were no steps leading up to this one, so the easiest way inside the structure was to either get a running start and jump in or pull yourself up by grabbing onto either side of the doorway. I elected for the run and jump version and totally ripped my shorts down the leg. I'm in this rundown cabin and I take a shot of my girlfriend and her parents outside the other building. I turn and take shots of the holes in the roof of the cabin I'm in and then I hear an odd noise, like one of them is shuffling debris just outside the doorway that I jumped through. So I stop and stand still, listening. 
Then I hear an obviously loud knocking coming from the doorway. I quickly turned and I see all three of the people that I'm with still outside the structure across the way. No one was near me. So I turn back toward the other end of the cabin, the one that I'm in, and I just stare toward the doorway. Seconds later, there's more shuffling, followed by three obvious footsteps. The first one is the loudest, I think, because of how you have to enter the building. You can't just step in. So these three footsteps sounded like they walked right toward me and then stopped. I stood there for a few more seconds and then slowly walked toward the doorway. After that, I never heard anything again. It was my first and only experience like this. I wasn't alone. It was in the middle of the day. It was outside and it was very sunny and bright. So I guess that's the least scary way to experience this. In any case, I'll take it. Either way, there was nobody near me and nobody in the cabin with me that could have made that sound. So I don't know what happened, but it definitely wasn't natural. My boyfriend and I rented a cabin in the middle of nowhere in upstate New York. We arrived on Tuesday. By Wednesday morning, I awoke with a deep cut on my hip. On Thursday morning, we were awoken by the TV turning on by itself. On Friday, my boyfriend started seeing shadows out of the corner of his eye. And then that night into Saturday morning, we were about to go to sleep at 3.30. We stayed up really late. As soon as we turned off the lights to sleep, we heard a deep guttural growl that lasted for about two seconds. We both immediately froze and then turned the lights back on. Now we were wide awake. We then realized that pictures of one child in the house had been defaced and an extremely heavy chandelier started swinging. I'm not entirely sure what was in there, and we're not totally positive if it's safe to return. My grandparents used to live in the Ozarks in a tiny house in the woods. I loved it there. Being from West Texas, it was always nice to resort to a place with trees. After a year or two of living in the house, my grandparents decided to renovate it to make it look like a log cabin. I had always felt something really unsettling about the house, and I warned them to be careful because renovating the house could stir up unpleased spirits. They went ahead with the renovations, gorgeous woodwork on the house, with two beautiful decks looking out onto the mountains and an entire new living area in the basement. It was so pretty and I was really excited to stay there in the summer. When I arrived though, the atmosphere was tense. It felt angry, even though my grandparents were very welcoming. It was quite strange. I got an official tour and for the most part, the interior was the same. Then we went to the basement. I was overwhelmed with fear. I was hesitant to go down alone. And when I would, I could never stay for long. I always slept upstairs. I never felt safe down there. One day I was making my way down the stairs to get some laundry, which was located across from the basement. I had only taken about three steps down when I suddenly felt cold and couldn't move. I just felt petrified. It wasn't too long before I felt a force on my back. And the next thing I knew, I was sliding down the stairs. I was still so petrified that I couldn't even scream. It was a silent fall. When I could move again, I rushed for my clothes and ran back up the stairs and I didn't go back down for days. A week or so went by. 
It was July 3rd. It was storming all day, but still pretty warm outside. My grandparents had left for a party down the street, and I had decided to stay and hold down the fort, all alone. I was upstairs in their big open loft on their computer, just killing some time. It was still storming outside, and it was the last moments of daylight. I was listening to music with headphones over my head, browsing YouTube and the like. I felt a familiar cold breeze, but instead of my entire body, it was just my neck. And instead of it being extended like wind, it was brief. It was like somebody was right behind me and just blew on my neck. I wasn't moving. I was too scared to even breathe. I just stayed still, the headphones still on my head. All of a sudden, my headphones flew off with such force that they hit the computer screen in front of me. I screamed, ran, and panicked. I tried turning on the TV, but all it was was startling loud static. I tried turning it off, but it wouldn't. Trying to calm my nerves, I looked at a painting of a meadow that my grandparents had hanging by the TV, and I saw it. I saw a man with the most sinister evil face I've ever seen, with empty white eyes. I felt so much fear staring into them. Trust me, he'd never been there before. I ran outside in the rain, shoeless and terrified. I walked to the house where my grandparents were, and I never explained what happened. This happened to me when I was in high school, living with my parents. One night, I went out with friends. I drank a couple of beers and I went back home. I was just a little tipsy, not drunk, and I decided to take a shower before going to bed. It was about one to two in the morning. The shower cabin that we had wasn't fixed to the floor or the walls. It was like a capsule, but it was very heavy and hard to move. I entered the shower and after a few minutes, the cabin started swinging left to right and it was very loud. I was standing trying not to move and it stopped, but as soon as I continued to shower again, it started swinging again. I stepped outside and there was my dad banging on the bathroom door asking what I was doing because the noise woke him up. I just got dressed and went to bed. The next morning, my dad asked me again what that noise was, and I tried to explain what happened. He said that I was just drunk and fell in the shower, so I moved the cabin. But that did not happen. I know that it didn't happen. I wasn't drunk. I had had maybe two beers. And I was standing the whole time. I had never fallen. It moved by itself, something that should have been impossible. I went to the bathroom and tried very hard to move or swing the cabin back and forth, but it was impossible. I still have no idea what happened that night. I have this problem since I've moved in to where I currently live. It's a rather basic problem. The lights in the basement go out at night. At first, I thought it was just the light bulb itself, so naturally, I changed it. Yet, whenever I wanted to grab something from the basement and it happened to be around 1 to 5 a.m., the light just wouldn't go on. I changed the bulb several times and it did nothing. The strangest thing is that I can literally have it turned on all evening and it's fine. Then I watch it go dark at night. It annoyed me to the point where I recently called an electrician to check if everything was all right with the wiring. Maybe it's some sort of automatic switch that turns it off during the night, right? 
Long story short, I paid quite some money for him to check everything, and he found nothing. I can't blame him since everything works perfectly fine during the day. The next thing I did was set up different lights inside of the room, a light with a battery. At this point, I got a little freaked out since it turned off as well. I carried it back upstairs, and after a minute or so, it worked perfectly fine again. I carried it back downstairs, and after a few seconds, it went out. I'm not exactly on the edge because my house isn't really haunted. I don't have bad dreams, no poltergeist activity or anything. It's literally just this strange light situation. As you can probably tell, I'm quite the skeptic. But could this actually be something paranormal? Could it be something natural? Magnetic fields or something? I'm not experienced with these kinds of things. Maybe there are other things I could try. I just think it's really weird that the lights in the basement, all of them, go out at night. I managed a resort in the Adirondack for several years. The place is old and rustic. It's miles from civilization and very peaceful. It was built in the 20s and had somewhat of a sordid past. It was built for a Canadian senator who would run rum down from Canada during the prohibition. We still had the underground locked safe room where he would store the booze as well as hidden booze hiding areas underneath some of the cabins. Calvin Coolidge stayed at a camp across the pond during his presidency and would visit my camp, for the spirits, I'm sure. Anyway, I met a girl and decided to sleep out under the stars on the camp's peninsula. It started to rain, so I suggested we sleep on the screened-in porch of the boathouse, which I thought was a pretty good compromise. So, after we were all set up, it was getting pretty late, about 1.30 in the morning or so. We were laying there, and I was all tossing and turning because I'd been asleep and woken up. So I have a hard time falling asleep after stuff like that. We'd been laying there for about a half an hour or so, when I hear the bathroom door open in the boathouse. It couldn't have been anything else but that door. I did all the maintenance on those old buildings, and oiling that particular door was on my work list for the next day. I knew exactly what it sounded like. My first thought was that it was my boss, the owner of the camp. She is notoriously nosy and has been known to spy on the staff in their staff quarters. So she was my first logical thought as to who had made the noise. Why she would have been hiding out in the men's bathroom in the boathouse for over an hour is beyond my comprehension. I proceed to hear footsteps walking across the boathouse, down the three steps onto the dance floor and stopping right in front of the door to the screened in porch. I lay there just waiting for the door to open and for my boss to call my name. As the minutes stretched out, I started praying that she would open the door walk away, sneeze, dance the funky chicken, anything. But there was nothing. The rest of the night I stayed up, stiff straight in my sleeping bag. No receding footsteps, no door noises, no nothing. Just my girlfriend, myself, the night, and an empty boathouse. The next morning, my girlfriend, she wasn't at the time, but she was the four years that followed, rolled over to me and immediately asked me about the footsteps the night before. She had also stayed up all night, waiting for some other sound to explain those footsteps in the night and heard nothing. She was terrified. We never went into that boathouse again. I unfortunately had to go to the boathouse myself on a daily basis. Everything was cool during the day. At night, 
I had to turn all the lights in the camp off. This is something I've done every night for the past three years. However, ever since that, there was always a sense of dread going in there, being alone in the dark in the boathouse. The worst part is that there's this enormous hanging bed in there in front of the fireplace. It was for the former camp owners to take naps on during the day, hung on chains, so that the bed could be lifted out of the way for entertaining guests in the evening. Every single night, that bed was swinging. A 175 pound bed swinging on its chains in the darkness of the boathouse. Until my last day at that camp, if I went in at night, that bed was swinging. For my lady's birthday, I took her to Gatlinburg, a popular, touristy, one main boardwalk town in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. We camped the first night, a few miles out in the woods at a popular location, Elkmet Campground. The campground was beautiful, tall green trees like baby redwoods, a clear water river scattered by checkered rocks, families with little ones running around, it was great. Through borrowing a tent, we found that we had no steaks and headed into town for supplies, whiskey, and hot dogs. It was dusk by the time we made it back to the campground. Most campers were surrounding their dissipating fires or cleaning up before the quickly coming night. Our tent was still up, but crunched up a little without the steaks allowing it to spread open as widely as it could. We fixed our tent and started a fire. As our night progressed, we found ourselves surrounding our campfire two to three hours later around midnight. Now, this was the sort of campground where another campsite is just 30 yards from yours. Bears frequent the area, and my girlfriend was already freaking out a little bit, which is why I booked our site in the dead center of the whole campground. All the other campers had gone to bed at this point, and the only sound we could hear was the slowly crackling fire and the light stream of the river flowing into the rocks. The clouds were covering a crescent moon, so there wasn't much light to begin with. We had flashlights and I would occasionally shine the light around us while avoiding hitting the other campers to confirm that we were fine and that there were no bears. Seemingly out of nowhere, from the campsite behind my girlfriend and to my left, a light shined directly on us and then all around in a frantic yet focused manner, kind of like the Eye of Sauron. I saw what appeared to be a man with the strangest gait I've ever seen. He wore a headlight and was focused on his picnic table. The man's gait seemed to me to be a little bit like Jar Jar Binks, just not normal. I could see through my periphery that the man focused his light on the picnic table, and whenever I turned my head toward him, immediately his light would hit my girlfriend and I. I could only see the outline of the man through the light of his headlight and the occasional flash of my light at his campsite once he continued to flash his light at ours in a very disconcerting way. This was the campsite across from us, where we saw no one at all the night prior. I could only see the outline of his body as all black, as if he was in an all black bodysuit. His movements were eerily repetitious. For what went on to close to an hour, this man would shine his headlight on his picnic table, make limited motions with his hands, if any at all, then walk five steps back to his tent, shine his headlight at his tent, then walk back to the picnic table, shine his light at us, and repeat it all over again. If this was just the man looking for something, he was on a cocktail of drugs. Once his light was on us for too long for comfort, I shined my flashlight on him for an extended period of time. It was at this moment when I went from annoyed to fight or flight. A chill ran down my back as I saw the outline of the man disappear in front of me and the light from his headlight bounce down to the ground, then fly across the ground from his campsite. It seemed to jump along the ground and into the bushes diagonally from both of our campsites. It wasn't like the headlight had been thrown, but as if it ran across the ground like if it was on the head of a dog. 
I took my flashlight away and watched his light slowly come back out of the bushes and climb back up to the height of a person. The shadow figure returned back, walking out of the bushes and back to the campsite to continue the same odd behavior. There were no sounds at all coming from this figure throughout the entirety of the night. Some time later, we went into the tent for shut-eye, and the shadow man figure was still at his odd routine. The following day, the tent from the shadow man's campsite was gone, like no one had ever been there. I then found out that just a mile from our campsite was a small town called Elkmont Ghost Town, with abandoned buildings and a cemetery up a trail a bit. I couldn't find any other stories of Elkmont mysteries, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are other stories involving the Headlight Man. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take and packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and I jumped in my truck. I get to this trail early in the morning, and I hike for about 15 to 20 miles until I find the right spot, and I head off the trail to find a place to put up my tent. I stumble upon this nice-sized clearing and decide that it's a nice, beautiful spot to settle down. I am exhausted at this point, but I set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line, and I manage to get a fire going. I roast some hot dogs and start to hear a sound in the distance underneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, most likely a deer, with a lame leg as it sounded like the animal was making a walking, dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it and put it out of its misery. I think nothing of it after that and I go back to eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and get into my sleeping bag. I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep yet, so I pull out a book I brought with me and I start to read by the light of the lamp. Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and I listen to this animal walk drag across the clearing toward my tent. It's really loud at this point and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted with the dragging noise following seconds after, almost like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing and stops. And I hear nothing. No breathing, I mean not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and I look into the clearing. There's nothing but trees and darkness. What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip up the tent and sit there listening for other noises. Nothing, just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and I tried not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, then women's laughter, and then sticks snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm really hearing is what I'm really hearing, or if it's just a product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughing from a couple of other directions, all different. Old men, old women, younger people, even children. And I confirm that it's real. The noises are closing in, and I grab my rifle, preparing to fire a warning shot off into the air in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier, and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed that the nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a shot into the night. 
I sat there and surveyed the tree line and saw nothing. I listened intensely to my surroundings. No laughing, and the forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a little bit and figuring that I scared off whoever it was, I sat down and in my exhausted state, I fell asleep. I wake up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not far from my tent. Alert, I grab my rifle and I listen to what they're saying. I can't make out much, but I hear something about being lost. So I shout, hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again, are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly a huge burst of flame like a flamethrower erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck with my head over my shoulder the whole way. I never heard anyone follow me. I never saw anyone or anything the whole way out, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me, just like I left all my gear in the woods that night. One night, in the spur of the moment, my best friend, my girlfriend, and I went camping on the banks of a creek that I lived within five miles of. We grabbed a 20-pack of beer, some blankets, and some cigarettes, and headed out in my piece-of-shit van with good spirits. It was about a week to ten days before Halloween, so it got dark on us pretty quickly. We made haste and gathered firewood with flashlights, ignited a fire, which rapidly grew hot, and threw off a lot of light, which allowed us to gather enough wood to chill and drink a couple of beers. We broke out the boom box and commenced having a good time. A few hours went by very quickly, and my girlfriend went to the van to sleep, although I don't know how, as it was pretty cold away from the fire. Anyway, my friend's girlfriend got off work at midnight and brought us more beer, though we didn't need it, as we had only drank about half of what we had initially brought. Those two got in an argument and she left. We watched as her taillights faded into the night. Then the weird stuff started happening. This place wasn't in the middle of nowhere. It was secluded, but we could see farmhouses from where we were. It was far enough tucked out and cold enough where nobody would be screwing around anywhere near us. All of a sudden, my buddy goes, screw that woman, and turns up the radio as loud as it would go, but not for long. It was about that time that I heard what he was talking about. A distinct woman's voice from across the creek scream in a guttural way, help me. I looked across the fire at my buddy to see him look as pale and sheepish as I felt. He turned down the radio before I could say anything. Dude, did you hear that? He said. He grabbed his cell phone and we both grabbed flashlights and shined them across the creek. He called his girlfriend to make sure she didn't have car trouble down the road. She was already home. That was like a relief and more stress at the same time. It wasn't her, so who the hell could it be? We stood there in the grip of fear. Lights shined across the water. We didn't hear anything for what seemed like forever. Just when we were about to chalk it up to imagination or jitters or something, we hear, help me. A woman that couldn't have been a hundred yards away from where we were standing, which was right on the opposite bank of the creek from where we were. We quickly shone our lights to where the plea for help was coming from, but there was nothing there. We both called out, hello, where are you? Hello? No response ever came. Being experienced in the outdoors, we both knew that if she was being attacked or chased, there would be other noises we could hear, like rustling in the fallen leaves, or as close as it sounded, some more cries for help or twigs snapping or something. By this time, whatever buzz we had from the beer was long gone 
We began gathering whatever we could grab, and I woke up my girlfriend and commanded her to start the van, and that we were leaving. She promptly did this, and it's probably a good thing that she did, because what came next still scares me to this day, and is completely unexplainable. As we were piling in, we hear, Help me! come from the very back of the van, which was in the complete opposite direction of where the screams had been coming from. Needless to say, we left the beer and radio and got out of Dodge. I had my girlfriend get out of the way, and I burned out, nearly wrecking the car in the process. I drove the dirt road about 60 all the way out. This happened in October of 2002, and I can't reconcile what it was. I tried saying that it was maybe coyotes or foxes. They make a yipping bark and a really scary scream, respectively. There aren't any mountain lions within 500 miles of this place, so it wasn't that either. But whatever it was spoke, and to my knowledge, none of those things do. Whatever it was, it scared two 21-year-olds into leaving a case of beer behind. Honestly, I don't think I want to know what it was. Although, I think I have a pretty good idea. In the summer of 2020, my friends Alex and Violet and I decided to go on a mountain vacation. COVID cabin fever had hit us hard and we were desperate to get out. We settled on a mountain estate and planned to camp and hike at several different locations. For one night, we thought it would be fun to book a cabin in the woods. Violet's parents had rented a fire tower once and loved it but a cabin beside a fire tower wall was all we could find. It was cheap, clean, and secluded. Excited to have a night where we could be as obnoxious as we wanted, we booked it. In the weeks leading up to the trip, we decided that it would just be a great idea to drop acid at the cabin. Violet bought an entire sheet in preparation for our arrival, and it was tucked into her bag as we pulled out of the driveway to make our way to the cabin. I remember having this unusual knot in the pit of my stomach, this aching feeling that gnawed at me. I told Alex and Violet that there was no way we could drop acid that night. Violet was pissed. We turned around and got into a massive argument, but I stood my ground. I just knew that we had no business doing that that night. Couldn't explain it, I just knew. Finally, the fireworks settled and we were off. The cabin was roughly 30 minutes away from the nearest town. It sat atop a mountain. We held our breath as we rounded the busted road that spiraled toward the top. There were no pull-offs, no other campsites. Just a long winding road that led us to the cabin at the peak. We settled in and started a fire to keep warm. As dusk gave way to night, we heard the unmistakable noise of an engine on the road, then the flash of headlights. A side-by-side -side with three kids arrived, and our nerves settled. They smiled, gave us a wave, climbed the fire tower, and left. We had heard that there may be occasional visitors to the fire tower, but they were the only ones who had come by. We doused the fire and moved inside, heated some hot dogs until they were lukewarm, ate them fast, and sat in the silence. You don't know how quiet it is until you're in the middle of nowhere. You can hear every rustle of the leaves, the whisper of the wind through their branches. You get so used to white noise living in the city. There's always the hum of an air conditioner or the dim roar of traffic to focus on. Here. The closest thing to white noise was the sound of our own breathing. We jumped at every noise, too frightened to speak to one another, and finally I had had enough. I cracked a few wine coolers, passed them to Alex and Violet, and then slapped a board game down on the table between our bunk beds. It didn't take long for us to loosen, and we were laughing, having the raucous good time that we had envisioned. Much soberer than we'd thought, but still, it was enough that we were able to ignore the rumble of the woods. 
Later, we'd all recall hearing noises in the background. The snap of a twig, the dim rumble of an engine. None of us wanted to rupture the air of nonchalance between us, so we had all collectively ignored it. Until a human hand reached up to the window between us and slapped it three times. We were screaming in an instant. Alex called 911, put them on speakerphone, and handed his cell to me. He grabbed pokers from the fireplace and passed them out. Violet started calling family members and saying her last goodbyes. I held my breath and listened for any more noise. Whoever this was, whatever this was, would have had to have heard us call 911. And now they were being careful to make a silent retreat. Dispatch arrived 20 minutes later, a lucky thing for a 1 a.m. emergency call, and had their dogs comb the mountain. Nothing. They suggested that it may have been a bear, but I could tell from their faces that they didn't believe that for a second. Neither did we. We'd barely cooked those hot dogs, and why would a bear smack the window by a couple of screaming kids, rather than the one closest to the pan that we had used to cook? Why would the bear knock on the window like a human? And why, when we screamed, did the bear make a stealthy retreat? They had no answers, but they had one anecdote. As they had sped to us, they had come across a car at the base of the mountain, but that was the only life that they had seen. I remember my blood ran cold, but Violet and Alex were too frazzled to absorb the weight of what they had said and dizzied by a new horror. Violet's car, thoroughly dusted by our drive up the mountain, was covered in handprints. Handprints that didn't match ours, that touched places we hadn't. We grabbed our things by the armful and threw it inside, eager to remove every part of ourselves from this mountain. We followed the police, grateful that every pothole found us farther and farther from that wretched cabin. We made it down in record time, and found lodging at a seedy hotel that reeked of cat pee. I couldn't sleep. The thought of that car on the road rang in my head. Remember, there was nothing else on that mountain. It was a narrow road to the top. No pull-offs, no other campsites. There was the fire tower. Maybe a visitor decided to spook us during their late night excursion. But the kids from earlier, we had seen their headlights. Whoever did this had stopped their vehicle farther down the road and then hiked the rest of the way. They didn't want to be spotted. They wanted silence and secrecy. Whoever this was hadn't been looking for a cheap scare. They had planned it. I don't think I'll ever know what the person on the mountain wanted from us. I don't know if it was a practical joke or the beginning of a night of terror. I'm grateful for Alex's quick wit in calling 911. I wonder if our visitor knew that we had service. It had certainly been a welcome surprise to us. Perhaps that was a wrench in the plan, enough to spook the person before they could make things ugly. In truth, I don't know if I want to know. I'm just really glad that nothing else happened and that we were able to get off that mountain. Something happened when I was camping 20 years ago, and I can't get it out of my head. If you have any ideas about what this might be, I'm very interested in hearing it. I was visiting my uncle and cousin, Sarah, in rural Pennsylvania. I was about 16, and Sarah was about 12. Sarah asked me if we could go camping, which meant pitching a tent at the top of this huge foothill that was on the property. The foothill was very steep and had woods at the top. I'd never been camping before then, but I figured if anything happened, we could just walk back down to the house. So I said, cool, no problem. We pitched the tent so the woods were directly behind it, with the tent opening facing out toward the scenery and the view. We roasted marshmallows, told campfire stories, and got in the tent around 11 p.m. or midnight. Sarah fell asleep right away but I couldn't. 
So I was just lying there, counting sheep. Suddenly, I heard leaves shuffling in the woods behind the tent, and I heard footsteps coming out of the woods behind the tent. There were a few steps, and then it would stop. Then a few more, and as it got closer, I heard it step on some large rocks. It sounded like a really large hoof stepped on the rock, because it made that same clop sound as a horse. As it got closer to the tent, I could feel the impact of each step in the ground under me, so whatever it was sounded very heavy. At first I thought it was a large buck, and I debated waking up my cousin so she wouldn't miss it. But then it kept coming closer to the tent, closer than a deer or buck ever would have. And suddenly I was overcome with this feeling of full body dread, like something was very, very wrong. Then I heard a really bizarre sound. It sounded like it was coming from about eight to 10 feet off the ground. And the best way I can describe it is like someone had a huge roll of masking tape and was pulling off a big section at a time. It was this odd tearing sound for lack of a better word. And each tearing sound was loud and lasted two to three seconds. I told myself that it was a deer and that it was tearing bark off trees and that's what was making the noise, but deep down I knew something was wrong. I didn't want to risk waking or scaring Sarah, so I just lay there as quietly as possible, praying that whatever it was would leave. But instead of leaving, the tearing sound got closer still about eight to ten feet off the ground. Now it was directly behind the tent, within five to ten feet. Right then I heard Sarah scream whisper my name, and I realized she was awake and heard it too. She asked me what it was, and I told her that it was fine, that it was just a deer, and to go back to sleep. She said, that doesn't sound like a deer. But I insisted that it was because I was too scared to make a run for the house with whatever this thing was right outside. So we listened to it slowly move around to the left side of the tent, still close, still making the sound every few seconds. And then things got even weirder. It started moving around to the front of the tent where the ground dropped off steeply. So each few feet forward was also several feet down. As this thing went around to the front, the sound stayed at the eight to 10 foot height and was slowly moving to the right. Now, if the thing making this sound was standing on the ground, then the sound should have dropped several feet, but the sound stayed at the same height all the way around. I even wondered if it was a bird, but it was moving too slowly and that wouldn't account for the hoof steps I'd heard before. After the sound faded into the woods, Sarah and I just lay awake for the rest of the night, too afraid to leave the tent. At first light, we booked it back to the house and told my uncle what had happened. Even though he didn't know what it was, he just shrugged and didn't seem too concerned. But that experience scared me so much I've never been camping since, since I know I didn't hallucinate or imagine it because Sarah heard it too. Has anyone else ever heard of anything like this? I've asked friends who are avid outdoorsmen, hunters, and trackers, and none of them have ever heard of anything like it. My story takes place on the big island of Hawaii when I was about 10 or 11 years old. My dad was into hunting wild boar and sheep. Sometimes he would take the family with him to stay at a cabin that my uncles had built. I can't say exactly where the cabin is located, but to get there, you would have to take a turn off the main highway onto an unmarked road and then drive about an hour up the mountain off-road through the woods to reach the cabin and hunting grounds. It's a small one-story cabin and the front door is just a sliding glass door. Across from the sliding door are the three bedrooms that had two bunks in each room, no doors. The bathroom was just an outhouse with no lights or running water. We had to walk through some bushes and trees to get to it, 
It was a nice little spot, not ventilated well and cold, but quaint. I couldn't help but feel like there were a lot of spirits there, mostly because my uncle said that a huge battle took place near the cabin during ancient times. I immediately think, damn, night marchers. To some, night marchers are just a part of Hawaiian folklore, but to native Hawaiians, they are very real. I was already creeped out by that place. I remember feeling really vulnerable. At some point during the trip, my cousin, sister, and I started wandering around outside of the cabin in the open area. It was basically a field of lava rock covered with grass, weeds, and trees that lined the outer edges of the perimeter. We were bored, so we grabbed some hammers and started smashing the small lava tubes to see if we could find something. The lava tubes we were smashing weren't giant, like caves, but just small hollow pockets or bubbles of air that formed during lava flows and hardened over time. You could just tap your shoe on them and tell that it was a pocket by the sound. Well, let's just say be careful what you wish for, because in one lava tube in particular, we found something. We smashed it, looked inside, and what we saw sent chills down our spines. It was a pile of bones sitting on long brown bird feathers. It didn't look like human bones, but like some kind of animal, maybe a chicken. Okay, you're thinking, wow, that's not scary at all. But the bones were perfectly preserved and still had some pink and reddish color to them. They seemed fresh. So we started pondering how the bones had gotten there there was no physical way that a person could have put those there. And why wouldn't they have gotten destroyed by the lava? The bones had to have been there for hundreds of years at least, because the volcano was no longer active. It was as if the lava flow went around the bones and hardened over it, protecting it almost. The only explanation we could think of was that it had been an offering to Pele, the fire goddess, and that we shouldn't mess with it. We immediately covered the opening with rocks and got the hell out of there. We never told our parents. The next morning, my dad asks us if anybody went to the outhouse early in the morning. We all say no. Oh, that's weird, he says. I woke up and saw somebody standing at the sliding door, so I thought maybe somebody had gone to the bathroom. We look at each other horrified, like what if it was the person that left the offering and we totally disturbed it and now we're screwed? We asked for more details. He said that it was too dark to tell who it was exactly, but that it was a large man and that he just stood there at the door staring into our cabin. My dad tried to play it off like maybe he was just dreaming, but I was terrified, fearing that I had disturbed someone's offering to the gods and they were mad at me. It could have been a human, sure, but it seemed really unlikely given our location. There were no other cabins or homes built at the hunting grounds, nowhere near them. Either way, I never stayed there again. This past New Year's was mine and my boyfriend's four-year anniversary. We typically don't do much, so this year we decided to make it special by planning a romantic getaway. At the time, the two of us were living in Seattle and wanted to rent a cabin in a snowy small town for the weekend. We found an Airbnb with a hot tub and we were sold. The cabin was, of course, the last house on the road. To get to it, you had to drive down a small removed private road that ended in a roundabout. Off the roundabout was a long uphill driveway leading to our cabin. We got to the cabin and it was snowy and beautiful. The cabin itself sat on top of a garage and you needed to take stairs on the back side of the property to get to the front door. 
When we got inside, there was a booklet with all of the cabin's info outlined. The book said that during the snowy season, don't be surprised if their contracted snowplowers showed up to clear off the driveway. Okay, sounds good. We unpacked and realized that there was no service on either of our phones, but the booklet told us there was a landline in the cabin if we needed anything. We spent the first night by the fire, playing board games and drinking wine. The weekend was exactly what we needed. We planned to spend the next day in town, and that night, I had booked us a reservation for a nice dinner. We were gone almost all day, only returning briefly to get dressed up and enjoy some good food. Dinner was great, and we were excited to head back to the cabin for some champagne hot tubbing. While at dinner, the temperature had dropped and it snowed for the first time that day, coating everything in a fresh layer of powder. We drove down the private road and got to the driveway. At that point, my boyfriend stopped the car, headlights shining in front, and asked if I noticed the new tire tracks. I looked at the driveway, hoping to quickly disregard the new tire tracks, but there they were. Immediately, we remembered that the snowplowers could have stopped by, but the issue was we saw the tire tracks because of the snow, and who plows in the dark? We also knew that once we were at the cabin, we had no service on our cell phones. So we figured that we would head back into town and message our Airbnb hosts and ask them if them or one of their friends had stopped by the apartments. We waited for a while in town for a reply from our hosts, but didn't hear back. We could have called at that point, but it was past 10 and we didn't want to be bad guests. We figured we blew the whole thing out of proportion and might as well head back to the cabin. After all, I am big into true crime, spooky subreddits, and horror movies, so I figured I was probably just psyching myself out. My boyfriend drove us back, and this time we actually drove up the driveway. Toward the top of the hill, I noticed something. My stomach dropped as I noticed footprints on the property. We backed down the driveway and took a closer look to see if there were more footprints. From what it looked like, someone had driven up the driveway, reversed down, parked, and then got out of the car and walked onto the property. Since we had now also driven on the tracks, we couldn't find where the footprints ended. The property was quite large, with tons of trees and brush, and we knew that these footprints could go anywhere. The moment we saw footprints, we decided to call the police. We figured it was better safe than sorry. We would just have the officer go onto the property with us to check everything out. We drove down the road until we had service, called the police and waited for their arrival. The policeman showed up and we followed him onto the property. The police officer scanned the property and determined that there was nobody out there. Obviously, we were a little shaken up and a lot embarrassed but we thanked the officer as he left. Needless to say, neither of us wanted to sit in the hot tub in the dark woods after what we'd seen. Instead, we locked the doors and watched a movie, champagneless. We were both tired from the day and we passed out pretty quickly. At 3 a.m., we both woke up on the couch with the TV on and all the lights, laughing about how the night hadn't turned out quite as planned. As my boyfriend went to brush his teeth, we heard a noise. It sounded mechanical, and it only lasted a few seconds. We looked at each other and froze. The garage door. There are very few reasons that somebody would need to open the garage door of a guest-occupied Airbnb at 3 in the morning. Like I said, we woke up to all of our lights on, and the cabin had lots of windows. We knew that if somebody was outside, they knew we were there, and they could see us. I immediately grabbed the landline and dialed 911. We sat crouched in the Airbnb, praying for the police to arrive. We knew that whoever had made those tracks was still on the property, and this time they were making noise. As I sat talking to the operator, we heard a bang on our balcony, as if somebody had thrown something up onto it. 
I was losing my absolute mind when the operator told me that the police were nearby. All of a sudden, they were there. We saw the police lights and watched them search the property. Soon we heard banging on the door. It was the police. We were okay. At the door were two policemen, one right in front of us and one a little bit behind, kind of kicking around snow and looking at the ground. I immediately noticed that the police officer in the back was the one that had done the initial check on the property. The police officer told us that not only was the garage door shut, but it was locked, and again, there were no signs of somebody on the property. We discussed leaving, but the police officer said that the road conditions were too dangerous at that time of night. I looked over at the police officer who had to come out to the property twice, and I felt that I had deeply disappointed him. My boyfriend and I went back inside, again locking all the doors, and tried to sleep. The next day we were leaving, and while we survived the night, I didn't feel right in the cabin anymore. It was forever the spooky cabin in my head, and I wanted to leave. As we packed, we heard the same noise that we had heard at 3 a.m. It turns out it was the heater. A heater that sounded just like the garage and lasted for the same duration. My boyfriend looked at me and immediately said, you really need to give up your murder shows, and walked away, as if. As for the banging on the balcony, it was just the perfectly timed fall of a pine cone. A really big pine cone. I promise I'm not paranoid. I think back on this story a lot, and I'm very embarrassed about how little came of it, but also incredibly grateful for the same reason. But, still, somebody drove onto that property and walked around. And that part still deeply unsettles me. It was about late November in Colorado, and I was about seven or eight years old. My father got the idea of taking us all for a weekend to a cabin that he was going to rent. My mother thought that it was a great idea for me, my sister, my father, and my mother to all bond. So that's exactly what happened. We rented a cabin for a few days. We took off school on Friday to get a head start on getting there, which I had no issue with. We got there and it was really cold. Well, it was almost December, so I guess it made sense that it was so cold. Anyway, we got all set up and decided where we would all sleep. We ate dinner and then we all got set up for bed and were thinking about what we would do the next day. We got there kind of late, so we couldn't do much on that first day. That night though, I heard noises outside it sounded kind of like footsteps. I looked out the window and saw nothing, so I figured it must have just been an animal. I tried to go back to sleep, but then about 15 minutes later, I heard it again. I woke my sister up. She was about 11 at the time, and she heard it as well. We both walked over to the window and saw something out there, but we weren't quite sure what it was. We decided that it would be best for it to not see us, so we went back to sleep. I had a really hard time sleeping that night, and so did my sister. But when we eventually woke up after somehow falling asleep, my mother was inside making breakfast and my father was outside. I asked my mom if I could go outside with my dad and she said sure while my sister stayed inside and waited for my mother to finish breakfast. I walked outside and my father was talking to some man, a short chubby man. He had a shaved head and was wearing a veteran cap. He looked really nervous too, for some reason. He was sweating a lot as well, even though it was freezing outside. I walked over to him and my father. My father looked at me and said, oh, this is my son and told him my name. The man looked at me and said, nice to meet you, kid, name's Patrick. He smiled and looked at me. I smiled and greeted him back. 
and it may have been rude at the time, but I was just a kid, so I asked him, You look kind of scared. Are you all right? And he kind of coughed and replied with, Yeah, I'm fine. I uh, just went through shell shock. I'm a veteran. He said this, as though I couldn't tell already what the cap he was wearing, but he seemed normal after that. My father seemed to really like this guy, and I liked him too, at first. He told my father that he had also rented a cabin with his family, and that they were really close to us, so he had decided to introduce himself. My father invited him inside for breakfast, and he stayed, and it was normal. I went outside to play after that with my father and Patrick. While outside, I fell and scraped my knee and started crying. My father was inside at the time, a bad time for him to be inside. My mother was calling for him and he ran inside while I was out there with Patrick, alone. Patrick ran over to me and told me to come with him to his cabin because he had band-aids. I agreed and went with him. I wasn't a very smart kid. I went with Patrick and we talked about what I liked doing and I told him about the video games that I played and stuff like that. Then things got weird. He asked me what shoe size I was and how old I am. I didn't know what my shoe size was, I told him, but I told him my age. He just kind of chuckled and said something like, good to know. Also, his cabin was nowhere near ours. It was way back. It took about 20 to 25 minutes to walk there. I was tired and there was no point in getting the band-aid anymore, but I still decided to keep going since I had walked so long. When we entered the cabin, he told me to go first, so I did. As soon as I walked in, I realized something. There was nobody in there. No family. I asked him where his family was and he didn't answer, pretending like he hadn't heard me. He locked the door and then I got kind of scared. He said, I'll be right back with the band-aid kiddo. He walked into the kitchen and pulled one out of somewhere and then walked back and told me to have a seat and he would put it on. I sat down and he put it on me. He also held my leg with his other hand and kept rubbing it and said, you're a rather muscular kid. I like that. Obviously, I got kind of scared and immediately stood up. He asked me what was wrong and I told him nothing, that my leg was feeling so much better. I then thought that my parents must be worried sick about me and that I should hurry back. He insisted that I stayed a little bit longer and that I ate there. I didn't want to, but I was alone, and if I ran, I didn't think I could find my way back to the cabin. The door was locked, so I just agreed and decided to eat with him and get it over with. He asked how much I weighed. I guessed and said about 73 pounds. He smiled, nodded, and said, perfect weight. I said, perfect for what? But he just kept smiling. I was really weirded out and asked him if I could go. He told me no, that things were just getting started and I shouldn't miss out on the fun. He had such a weird tone when he said it too. Then I heard a big bang come from the bedroom. It was a closed door. Patrick stood up and looked kind of angry. He walked into the room and shut the door behind him. I then heard him yelling, did I effing tell you that you could move? No, stay the F where you are. I have company. He then walked out with a smile on his face and shut the door slowly. Sorry about that. It was just my wife. She's really sick and not allowed to be near visitors today. He was smiling while he said that. I wanted to go. I then looked around the room and noticed that there were clothes everywhere and it was really messy. He must have been living out here. At that moment, his wife walked out of the room. I'm hungry, she said. He looked pissed. Get back in there. His wife was extremely pale and looked like she'd been crying a lot. She was sniffing and had red circles under her eyes. 
She looked at me and then just walked back into the room. I asked him where his kids were. He didn't answer. He told me that he had kids clothes that he wanted me to try on. And that was the last straw. I knew I had to get out of that situation, but I didn't know how. I started crying and then he hugged me and he said, it'll be okay, little one. Nothing's going to happen. Just try on these clothes. He walked into the back room and I thought that that was the perfect time for me to leave. I unlocked his door and tried to leave as quietly as I could. I didn't care if I got lost anymore. I didn't want to take any more chances with Patrick, if that was even his name. I had a feeling that he had been lying. I mean, he lied about having kids, so who knows what else. I was in the woods trying to find my way back. I was still kind of close to his house, close enough to hear the shouting. I heard him yelling stuff to his wife, things along the lines of, where the F did he go? I knew I shouldn't have left him alone. You probably let him leave. I could have sworn I heard him call her a couple of pretty awful names. And then it happened. I stopped in my tracks. I heard footsteps. I went and hid behind a tree and I looked in his direction. He was outside and seemed to be looking for me. I was far enough away to where I could barely see him but I could tell he was looking for something. He then stepped out into the forest and I heard him shouting, hey kid, it's okay. You can come back now. You don't have to try on the clothes. And I have toys back in my cabin. All you have to do is come back. And then I ran. I ran as fast as I could in a straight line in hopes to find somebody in my family. I was running away and I thought I heard shouting, but I didn't stop to see what it was saying. Then after about an hour of running, I finally saw a cabin, my cabin. I ran to it. My father was outside looking around, looking for me. I ran up to him crying and told him Patrick wasn't a good guy, that he was really weird and was touching my legs and stuff. That's when my father immediately called the person he had rented the cabin from. The owner said he had nobody staying at that cabin. My father looked at me and told me to never follow any stranger ever again. We immediately left that day and asked for a refund for the next day. The guy renting them out apologized. The man that had the cabin rentals called the police and the police went back there and checked the cabin, but there was nobody there, not even his wife. His clothes and belongings were still there, though. Nothing really happened after that. They asked us questions and left. They never called us or told us anything about him ever again. Patrick most likely wasn't his real name, and he probably wasn't a veteran. I just really want to know what happened to him and his wife, and how he even got a wife in the first place, if she was his wife, and why they had lived back in that cabin. He seemed to have lived there for a while, I guess he left because he figured the police would be coming after him because he didn't rent the cabin. So many questions that I'll never get answered. I'm just really glad it's all over. And I'm really glad I got out of there. So I grew up in a house that had a few spirits in it. My family are all skeptics and would find some way to explain things away. A few experiences and then I'll get to the main story. First, our house was three stories with technically three master bedrooms, one on each floor. The one on the main floor we used as an office. I would constantly hear somebody walking around in the office at night sinks turning on, toilets flushing, and occasionally I'd hear talking. My parents would always say that someone was awake and making those noises, and that the toilet and water running was just faulty pipes. Maybe on the pipes, but no one was ever awake during the other things. Second, there would be a shadow figure that would pace on the top floor. 
there was like a balcony that overlooked the foyer, and I would usually see who I presumed was a lady in a dress, pacing. My parents just said it was the shadow of somebody outside. We were on a hill, overlooking all of our neighbors. I don't know how they thought this was possible. Third, I hated using the upstairs bathroom, which was my bathroom. I would hear talking and singing from the bathroom. When no one was home and I was in there, someone would bang on the door. One time I was showering and listening to music. I heard the banging really loudly so loudly that it shook the room. Then the locked door swung open and I heard a scream. My parents said it was just my brother pranking me, which is something that he never did. Anyway, on to the main event. My brother's about 10 years older than me. He was the only sibling living at home with my parents and I. He had the master bedroom in the basement. I was never really in the basement except for going to the garage because it was in the basement next to the bedroom. I always remember feeling uneasy down there, but I wanted a big room, so when my brother moved out, I begged my parents to let me have his room, and eventually they caved and let me have it. I moved all of my stuff downstairs, painted it and everything. I loved my new room. I was talking to my brother about it one day, and he casually says, Watch out for the little girl who lives down there. She likes to laugh. I was shocked, as obviously he was kidding, right? My whole family, besides me, never talked about stuff like that. I just laughed and shrugged it off. I figured he was probably trying to scare me. About a week after I moved into my new room, I had a friend come over, and we were just laying on the floor next to the bathroom, laughing and stuff like that. She had to go to the bathroom, so she closes the door and I was just kind of zoning out. All of a sudden she goes, that's not funny. I asked her what she meant as I hadn't done anything. She said that she heard somebody laughing right outside the door, but I didn't do anything or hear anything. She left freaked out and I assumed that my brother put her up to it since she liked my brother. A few days later, I hear someone in my bedroom while I'm in the shower. I call out thinking it's my mom, but I don't hear anything. I get out and as I'm putting my robe on, I hear a little girl giggle. And then, are you looking for me? I freak out. I throw open the door to my room, but nobody's there. I check the garage and ended up setting off the house alarm so nobody could have come or gone through there without everyone knowing. I run upstairs and my mom is pissed that I set off the alarm and I told her what just happened. She then told me that my brother had a similar story when we first moved in, but that it was nothing. I called my brother and asked him why he told me to watch out for the little girl. He said that I was the little girl. He said he was kidding because, quote, you would always come downstairs and giggle really creepy. I never did anything like that. I told him that, and that's when he got legitimately creeped out. I still would occasionally hear the little girl. I never saw her, but she did like to laugh and open the bathroom and closet doors. I named her Sarah. My brother called me up today to ask me about this. He asked me if I was sure that I never tried to scare him by laughing, and I told him no. He got uncomfortable. I don't think he knows how to handle the fact that our house was mildly haunted. Let me start off by saying that this is a true story that happened to me when I was about 13 and I'm 27 now. Whether you believe it or not is up to you. My dad used to be a part of a small hunting club in Alabama, just a handful of guys he grew up with. Once a year, we would drive to the small town of Elba to camp for a few days and go hunting. 
There were a few different areas of land around the town that the club owned, and club members could go hunting there. One of these pieces of land was nicknamed the cemetery because, well, it had an old cemetery on it. Nothing really creepy about the cemetery. It was in the woods and the graves were of a slave owner and the graves were of his slaves. Now in this area of land nicknamed the cemetery, there are five or six green fields. Basically a cleared out area where there are no trees, just grass and a buck hut to hunt in. A buck hut is a tree house that you sit in and wait for deer to walk out onto the green field. This particular evening, we were going to hunt on a green field, number one, the plot directly behind the old cemetery. The evening started off normally enough. My dad parked the truck and we walked down the trail to the buck hut. We climbed up and started to wait and watch the woods. A little bit of time passes and my dad tells me that he is going to go out for a short walk to see if maybe he sees any deer on the trail. Keep in mind, I'm 13 years old. Not a big deal. I've hunted by myself before and I'm not afraid of being alone in the woods. Besides, it was still pretty light out. So I said, okay, and he climbed down. It was just me, my 32 caliber Marlin rifle, the grass field in front of me, and the dense woods around me. This is where things start to get strange. I sat there for a freaking eternity, or what felt like an eternity, and it was now almost twilight. My concern for my dad was growing because he still wasn't back yet. I was worried that maybe something had happened to him or that he had gotten lost. However, he's an experienced hunter, and if he was lost, he would yell or fire off a shot but the woods had been dead silent. I figured maybe he found a good spot that he wanted to hunt the twilight or dusk hour of the day because that's prime time for hunting. So I focused my attention on the grass field in front of me, just watching, listening, and waiting for a deer to walk out onto the field as the light of day began to fade. Just then, across the field, I saw and heard some brush moving and breaking. The thought did cross my mind that it could be my dad, but I highly doubted it. No way it could be him. That would be incredibly dangerous and stupid. I raised up my rifle, pulled back the hammer, aimed it at the moving brush, and patiently waited for what I hoped was a deer to walk out. Then a girl floated out of the woods and onto the grassy field. She was transparent white with a long flowing dress and long white hair. She floated from one side of the field to the other and then disappeared back into the woods. I watched her for a solid minute or two. I couldn't believe my eyes and I was petrified. Now I really wanted my dad back. A short time passed and it's now pitch black and I'm still alone. My concern for my dad was quickly turning into a panic, but I was too afraid to yell or go look for him in the pitch black woods where I had just seen a freaking ghost. I sat there for hours, terrified and alone in the darkness. Thankfully, he finally returned. He acted as if he hadn't been gone long at all. I asked him where the hell he'd been and he said he just went for a short walk up the trail, turned around and came back. That timeline made no sense. He was gone for hours. It was very unlike him to leave me alone for that long. He was adamant that he had only been gone for 15 to 30 minutes. We walked down the trail back to his truck. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. The whole experience still confuses me to this day. I don't know who the ghost was that I saw. I don't know if my dad went through some kind of time warp where time sped up. I don't really know. What I do know is that I never went hunting there again, and I don't plan on ever going back.
First, a little background information that's important to fully understand the story. My mother's sister and her husband have a house in Colorado that has a finished basement. The basement has a fully furnished bedroom, bathroom, a sort of living room area with a couch and TV, and a little kitchenette as well. I grew up visiting my three cousins, aunt, uncle, and grandparents every summer from the time I was five up until two or three years ago. I'm 21 now. The basement became more or less the guest room, so that's where I would stay whenever I would visit, so that I could have a little space of my own. That and the fact that their cat rarely ever went down to the basement and I am severely allergic to cats. This particular event occurred around the time that I was 17 or 18, and my younger cousin, I'll call her Megan, was around 16 or 15. The night started totally normal. We all had dinner, listened to music, watched something, and then at around midnight, we all headed off to bed. Because of a different experience I had down there a few years prior, I was really nervous about staying in the basement alone. So, my wonderful cousin Megan took one for the team and had been staying in the basement with me for the duration of my trip. We had been chilling in the living room of the basement for about three hours, drawing and just hanging out, when it all started. I was in the process of explaining the premise of a show I had started when we heard what sounded like an old man clearing his throat coming from the bathroom. I knew it wasn't her since I was maintaining eye contact with her the whole time and her mouth hadn't opened at all. And she also knew it wasn't me since I was in the middle of speaking. And of course, neither of us are old men. We both paused and then confirmed that we had both heard the cough. Our minds immediately went to, there's a man hiding in the bathroom, since they had had some people in the past attempt to break in through the basement windows. I wanted to go upstairs and get one of her older siblings to check it out, but Megan insisted on checking it out ourselves. We went to the bathroom, turned on the lights, and saw that it was completely empty. There was, however, a linen closet, which had the door closed. She opened the door, and we saw what honestly looked like the shape of a man trying to hide under some blankets. Megan immediately reared her leg back and kicked the blanket with full force, only to discover that it was just some blankets spilling over the lower shelves that we had forgotten existed. As Megan tended to her now stubbed toes, we heard that same cough come from what sounded like the entrance to the basement. We slowly crept out of the bathroom, looked around the basement to no avail, and without a word, both started packing up all of our stuff, like our sketchbooks and my laptop. And rather than leave the basement, we just went to the bedroom and locked the door. There was a giant floor length mirror in the room which we used to bar the door. We did all of this in complete silence, some weird primal understanding going on between us that we had to be as quiet as humanly possible. As we tiptoed around the room, we heard what sounded like shuffling outside the door. At that point, I was still somewhat convinced that there was a living person in the basement with us since the sounds were so clear and the feeling of there being someone else down there was so strong. Megan settled onto the bed while I sat against the wall next to the vanity, charging my phone. We were texting each other rather than speaking, since that pressure of being silent was still incredibly intense. We decided to each spam text her siblings, trying to wake them up to come down to our rescue, but there was no reply. Megan even texted her mom, but still, nobody woke up. I texted my mom, who did wake up, but all she said was to call the police if we were certain that somebody was down there with us. While we knew that there was something in the basement with us, we didn't know if it was actually someone who had broken in, 
and neither of us wanted to risk bothering the police for something dumb. After about an hour, Megan's phone started dying, so we decided to switch spots. For some reason, neither of us really understood. We were so terrified of making any sort of noise that we made sure to walk on our tiptoes and take steps at the exact same time to minimize the amount of sound we made. At one point, Megan started smothering me with a pillow because I had an allergy attack and kept sneezing. With the both of us now situated, we tried to relax, still being kind of terrorized by the sounds of someone shuffling around outside the door and the occasional cough. At around five, we heard what sounded like a small animal fall into the grate that also acted as a window for the basement bedroom and begin running around. The rocks at the bottom were moving and bouncing off the window, and then it went silent. About 10 minutes later, it sounded like another animal had fallen in and the sound started up again. This cycle continued for pretty much that entire hour. The entire time that all of this was happening, Megan and I were terrified. It was like that feeling you get right before your car gets rear-ended or right as you're about to go down a giant roller coaster hill. Just plain fear, anxiety, and the subtle feeling that something is just not right. It doesn't sound like much, but for some reason, Megan and I were just absolutely scared out of our minds. We both understood that we were not alone in that basement, and whatever was down there with us was actively trying to freak us out. We were saved at around seven. The sun started to rise, and we heard my uncle get up to take the dogs out. Neither Megan nor I had slept at all, and we suddenly felt exhausted as the adrenaline that had been fueling us the entire night seemed to die out. The sounds hadn't stopped, but they had significantly decreased as the hours passed. Now, hearing her dad up and about, we felt a little bit safer leaving the comfort of the bedroom. We quietly and quickly moved the mirror back to its space on the wall, and then, on the count of three, unlocked the door and ran to the stairs. We didn't stop to look around or turn off any of the lights, even though by that point the basement was fully illuminated with the sunlight and the lights that we had left on when vacating the living room. We booked it up the stairs and came to a screeching halt in the kitchen where her dad was making coffee. We immediately told him everything and begged him to check out the basement, still not fully convinced that it wasn't a normal person. He checked and sure enough, nothing had been tampered with and the entire basement was empty. Megan made some ramen for breakfast since we were starving and just wanted something comfortable. And after eating, she went upstairs to tell her mom. I stayed downstairs, eating and trying to come to terms with what I had just experienced. Her mom didn't believe her at first, but when I told the same story and Megan almost started crying from not being believed, she changed her mind. My aunt was resistant to the idea that her house, specifically the basement, was haunted. But then, later that year, she experienced it for herself. The main thing I remember from this whole ordeal was the fear. It was so raw and intense and there was just this weird knowledge that we weren't alone down there and that whatever it was, was not good. Megan and my other cousin theorized that it was Theodore, the name they had given the resident ghost that stays down there, but I don't think so. Nothing like that has happened to anyone else ever again, and it's just not what we know to be Theodore's style. I don't know. I don't know what was down there with us or who. I don't know why they were there or what they wanted, really. But there was something with us that night, and it scared me in a way that I have never, ever felt since. A couple of years ago, my brother bought a large piece of land out in the middle of nowhere, about 30 miles or so from cell phone reception. 
It's quiet. There's no light pollution, no paved roads, and not a lot of people around. Shortly after he bought the place, two of my brothers, the landowner and another, myself and our families, spent a weekend camping on the land and doing our best to clean it up. People had used it as a dump. There were many downed trees and stuff like that. On the second night that we camped there, I woke up in the middle of the night to relieve myself. As I was walking to the bushes in the dark, I realized that I could faintly hear music. This didn't really strike me as odd because I knew my brother had a radio in his camper. I finished up and went back to sleep with no further thought on the matter. The next morning at breakfast, I mentioned the radio and the music. Several other people recalled waking in the night and hearing music. But here's the kicker. No two people heard the same music. Finally, the brother who had brought the radio woke up. I asked him about the music, and he seemed a bit freaked out. He said that he woke up sometime during the night and went outside to smoke. He had heard music as well, and had assumed that it was someone else. I should mention, though, that he was the only one with a generator and a radio. If it wasn't his radio we heard, it wasn't anyone else's either. I've been back several times, but I'm a bit freaked out by that place at night. I have fun while I'm there, but I'm almost always armed, and I don't sleep in a tent anymore. I sleep in my SUV, with the doors locked. It might seem kind of dumb, but realizing that everybody heard different music when there were no people, no functional radios that were on, and no electricity is quite creepy. I took my super skeptic boyfriend on our first camping trip up to the Mount Adams area because I'd heard of some spooky UFO action in the area. We hadn't been dating that long. We saw some UFO action that defied his skeptic explanations in a dispersed spot, but nothing I hadn't seen before. Lights appearing out of nowhere, zipping along and then disappearing, lights appearing and joining up and then disappearing, stuff like that. It was pretty satisfying to hear him say, yeah, I have no idea what that was. A few months later, we were camping with his dad and stepson, who were both longtime veterans in the Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management. We mentioned the spots where we had camped, and his stepdad, who is not a believer of anything like this, said that the area we'd been in had been his beat for years. Without any prompting from us, he said, we were supposed to be up there looking for camp thieves. We never caught any thieves, but we saw a lot of weird stuff in the sky. When I pressed him for details, he got a little cagey, but he did tell a really creepy story about how these big black logging trucks with no lights would appear and steal lumber in the middle of the night. So he and his partner staked out one night to catch them. They were backed into the bush and had to sit in complete silence to let the truck cool down so nobody could detect them with heat or night vision goggles. The back of the truck was deep in the bush, meaning that only the forest was behind them. Then, after over an hour of sitting in silence, these huge bright lights appeared behind them, from deep within the forest. They were so bright he could see the entire outline of the truck, the antenna, the spotlights, and their silhouettes in the shadow. This was the early 80s, so we're not talking LED lights here. He said that he'd never seen anything like it. Then the lights went out, and everything was silent. No truck noise, no rustling in the forest behind them, nothing. I love the guy, but he has the imagination and personality of a potato. So there's no way he made this up. That's why it was so creepy and believable to me. He had a few other stories, too, that I'd love to get more information on. I, for one, believe him.
This is my story of a dude I happened to come across in the deep woods in Florida. This was in Ocala National Forest. I probably came across either a poacher's camp or a drug operation, and they put signs up to scare people away. In any case, my friend and I were hunting and stayed out past midnight looking for hogs. We realized we were way deeper into the woods than we had planned on being, and we began to walk out. We were probably three or four miles into the woods, off the main road. We were walking in the dark, heavily armed with AR-15s, sidearms, and fixed blade hunting knives in a hip sheath. So we really weren't afraid of anything. Plus, the moon was bright enough to navigate by, even under the trees. We had lights mounted on our rifles, and I had a large, powerful flashlight in my hand that I could make into a strobe or use as a club. The point is, we weren't paranoid of anything. We felt very prepared. We were heading back and we started to hear something hauling through the woods on our right. It was about to cross the trail in front of us. Most trails are old logging roads. They're pretty wide and they make square quadrants out of the forest. This particular trail cut across one of the quadrants and was overgrown and thin. We thought it was a deer or maybe a black bear. Either way, we couldn't shoot it at night. So instead of using the rifle lights, I used my handheld light. We waited until we heard it get near the trail, and then I turned my light on. All we saw was a pair of white legs cross the thin trail about 50 feet in front of us. They looked human. We were a little baffled, like what moron goes crashing through the deep woods at 1 a.m. in shorts and through the thick brush, not the trail. Super weird. But again, and armed as we were for hogs, we pushed on because it would have taken like 30 minutes extra to turn back and go around the quadrant. We hear crashing now and then in the woods, but it never got close to us again. Finally, we reached my car and I was relieved that it was still there and not broken into. We keep the rifles loaded, shove our handguns between the seat and the center console and get into the front seat. I begin to drive out of the forest with my moonroof open, and the stars were just gorgeous. It's easy to forget how amazing the night sky is in the middle of Ocala. About half a mile down the road, my headlights fall onto a man in a checkered button-down shirt and shorts, just walking along the road. We're miles from any paved road, and then it's another five to ten miles on the paved road to get to a town. Also, this is in the northern part of the forest, where there are no old cabins that were built before it was declared a national park. This dude had no backpack or anything. Was this what we saw across the path? If so, what was he doing walking out here at 1.30 to 2 in the morning with no supplies, no flashlight, nothing? He didn't even look at us as we passed. Anyway, as we got near the paved road, we unloaded the rifles and put them in the trunk and went home. It was a really fun trip, and I can't wait to go back, but I will always be armed in Ocala. Something seriously weird is going on out there. A few years ago, my mom and I decided to take a road trip. We were going to different camping and hiking spots along the California coast, and we were in the Big Sur area at the time of this particular incident. It was getting to be later in the day, so we had sort of been scrambling to find a campsite to sleep at. I can't remember the exact details, but for some reason, we ended up going to this long, windy mountain road that seemed to go up forever. Eventually, at the top, we found this secluded site with camp spots and even a bathroom. We didn't see anyone around, but the sun was about to go down, so we figured we could find the person in charge in the morning and pay them then. By now, it was dark, and we had been around the fire for a few hours. Our site was right at the edge of the trees. I heard some rustling coming from that direction, and I looked up. Two people were walking one in front of the other dressed in all white, perfectly clean clothes. The person in front had their arm back to hold the other's hand, but they both looked straight ahead, 
and they didn't acknowledge my mom or I whatsoever. They walked out of the woods, past us, and then right back into the trees. Here's what's weird. Neither of them had lights. They were totally barefoot, had no belongings with them, and were not dressed warmly. It was probably around 40 degrees, pitch dark and rough terrain. Not to mention the gut-wrenching, heart-dropping feeling I got when I saw them. I asked my mom if she saw that, and she said no, even though she was facing the same direction as me. I was on edge the rest of the night and had trouble sleeping. In the morning, my mom found the camp owner, paid him, and told him what I said I'd seen. He replied nonchalantly, Oh yeah, those are the night walkers. People see them around here sometimes. When she asked him if he thought they were paranormal, he said, Pretty damn sure. We got the hell out of there as soon as we could. Where do I begin? This had taken place a few years ago. I was with my best friend, and we decided to go camping at a campsite in Flagstaff named Lockett Meadow. We had taken our dogs, and after a day of hiking and exploration, we played around a fire and eventually went to sleep. I awoke in the middle of the night to find this deep figure outside our tent, burying itself into our tent. It had this weird way of hovering back and forth over my body and my dog, who was curled up, awake, and not moving or making a sound at the bottom of my feet. I look over and I see my best friend passed out and his dog. I'm unsure whether or not his dog was awake, but I was clearly the only one between my friend and I that was, and I'm experiencing this terrifying encounter. I eventually covered my head and thought about anything to make me fall asleep. The next day, I asked my friend if he had somehow been awake through all of that. I explained what happened, and he replied no and thought that I was lying. I told him maybe it was a bear or something, so we looked around our campsite but couldn't find any trace. No trails, no prints, nothing. We also had food out on a table near our tents, and a trash bag hung up on a broken branch. So even if it was a bear, I'm surprised it wouldn't have gotten into any of our food. Either way, I remember how scared I was seeing this dark object observing our tent. I don't know if it was the wind or a deer or a bear, who knows, but this is just one encounter out of the whole camping trip. The next night we decide to camp at Beaver Creek. Mind you, we were in Arizona. Before we settled in, we explored Sedona. We drove to Oak Creek and parked our car near a trail down to the water. We took our dogs and hiked to the creek. After we finished jumping in and swimming, we dried off and were about to head out. Next thing you know, we see from the corner of our eyes a big rock being thrown near us, making this huge splash in the water. We look up and can't see anything above us, so we run over stones and rocks to get a clear view of the top and we see nobody. We yell out a bunch of foul stuff and heard nobody running off or anything like that. When we got to our next campsite at Beaver Creek and set up there, my friend told me that throughout the trip, since we started in Flagstaff, he's had rocks being thrown at him, even before that big ass rock at Oak Creek. We looked at each other and thought maybe someone was following and messing with us. Then we sort of laughed it off and said that was impossible and that we were just trying to connect dots and have it be a cool adventure. Nothing happened that night and going into the next day where we packed up and headed home with nothing of a memory to be justified by. To this day, I'm still not entirely sure what we encountered. This happened at a school camp when I was about 11 years old. 
Our school camp was scheduled to be at a campground about two and a half to three hours away. I remember talking to people about the camp and where I was going, and one of my friends, who was a year older, told me that they saw something like a pair of eyes when they were down at the creek one night. Skip ahead, I can't exactly remember what night this was of the five-day camp, but I remember exactly what happened, and I always will. We were sitting with the other students, and we had just finished eating, meaning it was time to play games and to calm all the kids down. My friend Savannah told me that she needed to go down to our tent and change clothes, and asked if I would come with her. I said that I would, and one of the teachers said that I could go with her. Keep in mind, the tents were way away from the rest of camp, and it was actually a walk to get to them as it was a huge campground. So we got a torch and walked down to the tents. We got in and left our tent window open for light, as it would have been awkward to have the torch on. Stupid, I know, but we were young. We turned around and I started changing too. Then something very bright caught my attention. I looked out the window and there were flashing bright lights everywhere. And I swear there was no way it could have been a camera because there were tons at the window moving so fast. I quickly spun around and in like one second, they were at the door, then vanished. I quickly said to my friend, what was that? And we totally freaked out. We quickly finished getting changed and hurried back to our class and teachers where the teacher had just talked to the class. We had to explain what happened to the teachers. It seems like just a sicko taking photos when you hear the story, but I promise that I know it wasn't a camera. You can take my word for that. There was no way, and I've been around cameras modeling and stuff, so I know what all the camera flashes are like. I don't know what I saw that night, and I don't think I ever will, but I know that I will remember that night for the rest of my life.